you'll bear with us just one minute, we're waiting for Commissioner Rape to, he's supposedly coming in the building. Good afternoon. I will call to order the special meeting of the Union County Board of Commissioners on Wednesday, July the 7th, 2021 at 1 p.m. The special meeting is being held for the purposes of discussing the following topics. One, the Union County Water and Sewer Master Plan. Two, the shortfall, sh short line, water line extension program. And three, the interlocal agreement with municipalities. I'd like to ask Brian Matthews to introduce the first item, please, sir. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Commissioners. <coughs> uh, we have several topics here today, um, uh, so I'm going to take just a brief history on where we are with the Water and Sewer Master Plan, and then I'll introduce Jay Fulmer with Brown and Caldwell, and he has a presentation for you. Um, back in 2016 the board had an update to your water and sewer master plan completed um, it's been some time since we've had a full-blown comprehensive study of our water and sewer master plan so the board decided uh, that it was that time in september of 2020 you actually uh, approved the contract with brown and caldwell <coughs> to perform these services in march of this year we had a kickoff meeting that was sort of go off the go over the parameters of the program, how it's going to work, <coughs> what the um, company will be doing as far as that work goes. Um, I'm allow Jay to go into more detail as far as what they've accomplished <coughs> up until now. But I will tell you that there are some decision points that you're going to have to make. We're not asking you to make decisions today. Uh, we'll go over the, some of the things we'll need your input on, but at the July 19th meeting, we will have some decision points that we need from the board so that they can move forward with the study. And with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Fulmer and let him go through his presentation. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, what we'll be going over today, and you can see on your slides, uh, we're going to present an overview of the master plan and progress to date so you can kind of see the approach we're taking and the progress we've made on the master plan. Uh, this is going to be kind of a refresh of some of the data we showed you back on March 11th at the uh, kickoff meeting for the master plan. We'll review some points of interaction with the board. One thing that we've deliberately, deliberately built into the master plan is points of contact with you guys so that we can get your input, feedback, and approval as we proceed through the master plan. And so I'll show you some upcoming points of contact uh, with the board. Uh, finally, we'll present recommendations for the 2040 population and employment projections. Uh, that will be on the July 19th uh, agenda for approval. Uh, we're going to look at some of that data today. Uh, just to give you a preview of it, give you a chance to ask some questions, and if there's any additional information that you'd like to have for the July 19th meeting, we can get that prepared for you. All right. So outline of the master plan. The master plan is being executed in three main phases. Uh, phase one is determining the boundaries. Uh, so this is looking at things like what is the baseline conditions, desired level of service, uh, desired future state. That's further broken down into six different tasks. Uh, the color coding on the task, gray means it's not started yet, uh, blue means it's in progress, red means it's complete. So we finished project initiation, task one. Uh, task two is uh, defining levels of service. The only remaining item on that is your approval of the population and employment projections we'll be talking about today. Then that item will be complete. Uh, we are also currently developing the water, wastewater collection and the water distribution models, uh, as well as temporary flow monitoring to support that modeling. 
Uh, task six is the capacity assessment. That's where we're going to look at the system capacity versus the expected future demands. You can think of that as kind of like a, a gap assessment of the system. Phase two is where we develop solutions. That will include an alternatives analysis and selection. Phase three is prioritize and implement. So we'll take the selected alternatives from that alternatives analysis, develop a capital improvements plan. So that means projects will have uh, a schedule and a priority assigned to them. Uh, then we'll then have task nine, the master plan documentation. And finally, task 10 is stakeholder communication. We'll roll out the master plan uh, to stakeholders. Uh, so let me pause there. Any questions about process or about the overall scope of the master plan? When this master plan is presented to us, I would like to know the capacities on all of it mm -hmm. so that we know what we're working with uh, just to make sure that we're not assuming one thing and then we end up with another and then it's like well, this is what you agreed to. Right. I understood completely. And I want uh, numbers on this master plan. Yes, sir. Is there any target for the subsequent task? Uh, there is. Target dates? Yes, sir. That's a segue into this, actually. Okay. Uh, this is a look ahead to the board interactions we have planned. So, um, Later this fall, we've got a couple of key inputs. One, we're going to start defining alternatives that we want to investigate as part of the master plan, and we're going to do that with y'all's input and, and direction. The capacity assessment, we're going to present the results of that, and Commissioner Rate, that is exactly what you're asking about, is understanding the system capacity and having that defined and quantified. That's where those results will be presented approximately in November. Uh, the alternative selection, that's where we'll look at the processing of the alternatives and select what we want to build based on benefits, risk, and cost of each alternative. Then we'll then have a draft master plan for review and comment in March and targeting uh, approval of the final master plan in April of 22. So these are work sessions for future work sessions to get ready for? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Any other questions? Go ahead, sir. All right. So let's transition into the population and employment projections. Uh, before we talk about this, I want to be clear about what we're seeking approval on. We're seeking approval on the base population data we want to use for planning. This does not represent a commitment on your part to provide water and sewer service to any particular population set. This is just the basis for planning. Uh, so, so what this gets used for. The way this gets implemented into the actual master plan is we start with the population and employment projections. We're going to look at that data in more detail in a moment. That goes into these water and sewer models that we're generating that help predict like the size of pipes, the size of pump stations, how big treatment plants <coughs> need to be, and so forth. Those tools get used to develop flow projections, conduct capacity analysis, conduct the alternatives analysis, and ultimately to size the capital improvements plan. Uh, so that's how the data we're going to be looking at in a moment translates into uh, the master plan activities. All right, so any questions about that one before we, uh, before we proceed? Okay. All right. So the approach to population projection, I'm going to spend a little time trying to uh, explaining this one. Um, the basis of data we'll use comes from the Charlotte Regional Transportation Planning Organization. So that is a uh, regional organization that maintains demographic data for areas all around the Charlotte area, including Union County. Um, it is the most commonly used data source for modeling and master planning. It's comprehensive, it's detailed, it's, it's exactly what we're looking for. So that'll be the basis of population and employment data. However, in talking with some of the towns within the county, they have some specific planning data that we also want to be sure gets incorporated into the master plan. So what we're going to do is take that town planning data and we're going to augment the base data from the CRTPO, the baseline data. I'll show you how that works in just a moment. 
and we're going to have an augmented data set that includes both the baseline CRTPO data, but also incorporates the feedback that we've received from the town and the discussions we've had with them over the past couple of months. All right, any questions so far? All right. All right. I'll keep going. <coughs> so uh, this is the way this stacks up. Uh, some towns and some areas we're going to exclusively use the baseline data. It comes out of the box ready to use, uh, for lack of a better word, the CRTPO data. Uh, so the towns of Fairview, Hemby Ridge, Lake Park, Mineral Springs, Unionville, and the unincorporated areas of Union County, we're going to use the CRTPO data as is. Uh, reason being, when we compare it to the planning data that's available, it's such a close match that there's not really a difference in the data. So we're going to stick with that data set for those areas. However, some of the town-specific data, that's the column on the, on the left, we are going to augment, and that includes Indian Trail, Marvin, Stallings, Waxhaw, Weddington, Wesley Chapel, and Wingate. Um, we're just going to look at two examples, Indian Trail and Stallings, just to illustrate how it works because this tends to get very repetitive when we're looking at each individual town data. Uh, but I do want to show you that so we can see how the process works and how the two different planning sets are different from each other. So this is illustrating uh, basically the same side in just a graphical format. So this is the outline of Union County. The areas you see in gray are areas that are going to be covered by this base CRTPO data. So if you see it in gray, that's going to be exclusively using the base data unmodified. The colored polygons, so these, these other towns where we have this specific data, what we're going to do is we're going to extract the base CRTPO data and replace it with specific data from the towns to get a new population data set. So that's how the data uh, gets, gets augmented. Can you also come back and give us an idea of the delta between your towns and CARPO? I hate to say it, but you know, I want you to look at CARPO's effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Um, at, just think about it when you're driving back to Charlotte today. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, uh, we're gonna, you're going to see a direct comparison, and you'll see just how close the data sets are. Okay. They're, they're very, very close match. All right, so again, we're going to look at two examples. The one we're going to start with is Indian Trail. Uh, so what you're seeing on the map is their land use map. There's a lot of colors there. Uh, this includes things like zoned industrial areas, low, medium, high residential, include some park space that obviously wouldn't have a big impact on sewer. So what we're doing for all those colored blotches is we're taking out the CRTPO data, replacing it with this town-specific data. That's what we're going to look at on the next slide. Here's the results. There's a couple of stuff on this slide, so let me walk you through it. So a lot of the slides we're going to see are going to look very similar to this. Um, for right now, the data that's shown in green is residential population, thinking of that as a person living in a house, living in a townhouse. It's a person that lives within the county. Um, the blue lines are employment. So think of that as someone that works at whatever business. So it's, it's an employment count. The reason we treat them differently is because employment produces and demands water wastewater at a very different rate than residential population. So we treat them differently so that we can correctly account for water demands in the master plan. To give you an idea in rough numbers, employment consumes water at about half the rate of someone in a residence. And if you think about that in your everyday life, that's how it works. Because it's your house, you're using your washing machine, uh, shower and whatnot at work, you're probably not going to be doing dishes and things like that. So when you're at work, you're consuming less water. That's why we segregate the two pieces of data, though. So I want to make that clear. Um, now, drilling into a little bit further, you've got two green lines. The dark green is the town data, so the higher number. So in 2040, Indian Trail would have a population of uh, 49,100 people. If you look at the CRTPO data, okay, so it's calculated completely independently of that top number, you get 46,500 
From a planning perspective, those are virtually identical. Those are very, very similar numbers calculated independently, so it tells us that the two data sets agree very well, whether using the town data or CRTPO. We still are going to recommend using the town data when we get to the recommendations, so we'll look at that. Looking at the bottom at the employment data, it's even a tighter fit. So in this case, believe it or not, the CRTPO data is slightly higher than what the town-based data is. But for all intents and purposes, for a planning perspective, these are identical numbers. So, uh, so this is showing that delta uh, between the two data sets. Again, two ind independently populated uh, variables here. So I've thrown a lot at you, and we're going to look at a lot of similar slides. So any questions, anything you want to drill down into about interpreting uh, what we're looking at on this slide? Any questions? Good, sir. All right. All right, second example, we're going to look at Stallings. In Stallings, we took a slightly different approach. Uh, for Stallings, we found that their land use plan matched very well with uh, the, the baseline planning data. So we did something slightly different. What we did here is we took their planning projects that are currently on the books, and we only replaced those segments. So. If it's something that's definitive, someone knows what the development is, they know what the plan's going to be, know the housing units or whatever it's going to be, we only replace those specifically just to see what kind of an effect it would have on the, on the data because that's known quantities where we felt like we wanted to see how that would affect things. Um, very similar to the results we saw before, slightly bigger delta here on population, the difference of about 4,000 people uh, is the difference between the two calculation methods. But again, thinking about something from a planning perspective, 4,000 people spread over that area isn't going to make a huge impact on the outcome of the master plan. It's not that many people um, in the scheme of things. And we're also seeing at the employment data, again, a very, very close match between the two data sets. Um, so our recommendation is going to be using the augmented data, but we're showing this just to show how close they are. There's not a tremendous difference between the two calculations. Okay. All right, so countywide, how does this roll up to the whole county? What we've done here is we've excluded City of Monroe from this data, so that's, that's all taken out. So looking at the residential population, the top two green lines, from a starting population of around 210,000, you're going up to, if you follow the CRTPO data, you'll be at 296,000 residential population by the year 2040. If you follow the CRTPO data that's been augmented by new information from the town, you're going to be at 309,500. So it's a difference of about a little over 13,000 people spread over the whole county. Um, keep in mind that at the master plan scale, when we're sizing water systems and sewer systems, that population spread over the whole area is not going to make a tremendous difference in the end result of the master plan. It's just not that many people. It's not that big of a delta. But Nonetheless, we are going to still recommend going with the, the top line. Similarly, when you look at the employment data, same story, very close correlation. The town-specific data is slightly higher than the CRT, CRTPO data, but still very, very similar. So this, this is the end result of the, the big headline of the analysis, is the two independently calculated approaches are extremely similar to each other. Um, but we, we were going to recommend going with the town data. We'll talk about that in a moment, but uh, I wanted to pause here because I think this is kind of directly uh, what you guys were interested in and seeing what the real delta is between the two. Commissioner Simpson. Just curious, uh, <clears throat> sort of which comes first, the chicken or the egg in, in designing a water and wastewater master plan. Mm -hmm. Are we looking at these uh, population projections and building the system to match it or we assuming that uh, based on our master plan this is the uh, increase in population that will occur does that make sense uh, it does um, two things there we're going to assume this is the baseline population for the whole county so this is going to be at the start of the master plan this data is a given that this doesn't get modified moving forward from today the things that change are what is the service area? What areas are we going to include? What 
pro what projects are going to be prioritized. In other words, what's going to get built first. Those are the different knobs we're going to look at turning as we get into the master plan. So this is, uh, once it's selected, this becomes the baseline data. It does not get modified. The changes we're going to look at is what order projects get built in, how large they are, and what kind of coverage we want to have for water and sewer, if, if that answers the question. Yes, thank you. If I could, have, uh, the, you have the projections you just showed us for Indian Trail and Stylings as examples, and you have this countywide result. Mm -hmm. But for, for instance, in any selective service area where you may have multiple uh, municipalities and then an area uh, it might be uh, equally sized unincorporated uh, Union County how do you how are you or what methodology are you using to determine the base number population for the unincorporated area outside the municipality for, for that in inside that service area uh, so do you mean when service area do you are you referring to like a treatment plant or water right. plant size understood um, the data that we're looking at let me scroll back and I can answer that question I think with the map um, so what you're looking at on this map if you see all these little squiggly polygons these little lines uh, that are that are on the map each one of those is a discrete area that contains the population. So the population is assigned to that area. What we can do is we can assemble these small polygons into a whole service area. So we have the data very discreetly, and we can even further subdivide it from that, frankly. Uh, but we can assemble that into whatever service area we like, right. if that answers the question. Right. It, 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 it does. It, um, I was just wondering how you would go about because you know in an unincorporated area it the density of population the concentrations of population vary uh, pretty dramatically depending on which area of the county you're in uh, and, uh, and if we were looking at specific service areas for a treatment plant mm -hmm. you know it, it that number becomes very important yes sir understood now, also do you take into consideration uh, building plans that are in place have been approved you know the 600 houses that are coming up in one particular section all that's included uh yes sir it, well in in some towns specifically we looked at specific development plants when we had them let me show you how that gets used um the the data available varies that's why i'm kind of giving you an answer that not every town has that level of data available mm -hmm. but generally speaking where we had development plants development plans on the books we absolutely incorporated them and that's why you're seeing this knee of the curve if you can see there's this little bend in the data it's not a straight line the reason for that is because a lot of the plans for developments that are on the books now would be in place by 2025 and that's why you're seeing that little uh, okay. peak there that's how that gets incorporated Does that count for the county as well it does not count for the county. Uh, we can certainly ask if we have development plans that are specific within the county that we can incorporate. Uh, when we did the related east side study, that's exactly what we did. Uh, so we can get that data and where it exists, we can fill that in. I thought that 600 house development is in the county. You wouldn't capture it in one of the municipalities. It, right, right. So it's not in this data, the, yeah. the one you're referring to, but so we I, can certainly I, ask for that I would ask that data. you to utilize the county data. Our staff will be able to work with you to give okay. me a projection all right Stoney, do you have a question um, kind of piggyback on Commissioner Simpson's question um, if you'll go back to that three hundred and nine thousand and twenty forty um, so I think what he was asking and, and, and this is what I was curious about what kind of effects could economy um, not building uh, facilities uh, if we like for example got delayed on sewer uh, if we had or turned down for permits if uh, mm -hmm. if the um, commissioners don't agree to raise rates whatever happens is that number going to happen regardless of the decisions that we make or is that number going to be affected by the decisions that we make yeah, I understand the question 
Um, it's a tough thing to answer uh, because this is just represents the demand that's being asked of the system, right? So if everyone got their way, this, this is what the growth would look like. Um, <coughs> those decisions you're talking about certainly would affect it, at least in the short term, uh, of the order and how fast things come online. Um, so yes, decisions that you make can affect how this works out. One thing that I will say is that in all master planning and all system management, you generally expect to update this regularly, right? So you can see economic effects, how they've taken place, you know, in terms of your crystal ball. So when you get to say your 2030 update of the master plan, you might have some of that data available and you might know what the recent effects of economy have been so that you can kind of act as a check when you do your update for the master plan. So it's built into the process to evaluate that as it goes. You have the same process when you have a project that comes up to be constructed. You always do a detailed evaluation of the base planning data beyond the master plan just as a verification uh, of, of where things stand in terms of growth and development as project justification, if, if that answers the question. Yeah, and it just seem, it seems like, well, the 209.5 on the 2020, that that's not recent census data, is it? We should be at like 230 to? Uh, we've got some recent census data. I'll, 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 I'll show you what we've got. It's higher as a comparison. That, right? It excludes Monroe. Oh, it excludes right, Monroe. Right. So yeah. including Monroe, um, so this, whatever decisions Monroe make could add to that, it's going to add definitely to that. Monroe now would add to that 309.5 and then whatever they grow would also add to that number as well. Countywide, why, why did from, we exclude Monroe? Because from a master planning perspective, they own their own water and sewer system. So right. we look at Monroe in terms of what the uh, agreement between Union County and Monroe is. So we wouldn't serve the entirety of Monroe as part of the master plan. We need to look at it at a smaller scale to understand what Monroe's demands of Union County will be, and it won't be purely based on Monroe's growth because Monroe supplies their own water and sewer. Mr. Ray, when you, another thing I would like to see, and I, I think it would benefit all of us, is when this, this final report comes back, I would like a, a page added where it talks about the developments that are already on the books, mm -hmm. but not built out or not even started, but that could apply for permits with the state. They're past the zoning stage. Mm -hmm. And it would be nice to, to have that on a list of a page of its own. I mean, I'm assuming you're going to have X gallons needed for development, but then have a page that shows how many houses in each subdivision that's coming at us. Mm -hmm. And then it would also be nice to have a county map to show those numbers, like one block might be 200. You see what I'm saying? You want to be able to see the details. Sir. Of, you want to be able to see the details of what each development is. I'm asking, that's the question. Yes, uh, to know where the growth could mm -hmm. happen. No, understood. Yeah, that's, that's very easy to provide because we need to have the data anyway to, to, to provide that, to incorporate that into the modeling data. All right. And we can come back to this, this slide, of course. Um, so let's see how this looks when we compare it to uh, census data. Uh, so what you're seeing on this graph is the thick gray line is census data from 2000 to 2020 uh, for the county. This, again, is discounted Monroe, just so we're comparing apples to apples with everything. So what we saw between 2000 and 2010 was a very robust growth rate at 5.6%, and that's kind of been confirmed anecdotally talking to everybody that's you know, been around the county uh, back in the, the early 2000s. What we saw between 2010 and 2020 was still a good growth rate, but it backed off a little bit to 1.9%. Uh, so there's uh, th that decade had a little bit of a growth back down. The two data sets that we've showed you to see how those line up so CRTPO data only is showing a growth rate of 2.2%, so a little bit quicker of a growth rate than what you've seen in the last decade. The augmented data is showing a growth rate of 2.3%. To give you another data point to lay on top of this, the Office of State Budget and Management 
maintains projections as well. Their numbers for Union County are 2%. So our numbers are in fairly good alignment with an independent uh, piece of demographic information. So a purpose here is just to show where these growth rates fall relative to what historic has been. Okay. okay. All right, so conclusion and recommendation. So the big takeaway here is that we just aren't seeing a significant difference between the CRTPO data and the augmented data that includes the specific data from the town. Town data is a little higher, but it's not substantially so. Our recommendation is to use the augmented data because it is incorporating uh, data that we specifically got from the towns as part of the master plan development process. So we met with all of them um, and, and, and a lot of thought and care has gone into developing that data set. So that's our recommendation and the uh, kind of the parting thought and we can go back and look at all the other data as much detail as you like is uh, what would be helpful for your July 19th meeting uh, to approve this data set that we've just shown you for use in the master plan. Any other details we can provide, we're happy to do so. Commissioner Russian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one of your requests here is to ask you to approve population projections at the July 19th board meeting. Mm -hmm. So you want us to bless that we'll have 100,000 more people in 20 years, or what, what are you asking? What, what right. are you asking? Uh, that's a blessing. Uh, that's what we're asking is uh, we're asking for your concurrence that this is the data set we'll use. Uh, the, so the dark green line at 309,500 is the 2040 population, and 173,000 is the total employment number that we'll use for the master plan. So we're not asking for a blessing so much, but as your concurrence that this is what we'll move forward with on the master plan. Keeping in mind that we have a lot of other analysis to do in terms of sizing and selecting and programming projects into the master plan. This is just approving, here's the base data set we would like you would like us to use for for executing the master plan. So what if we said 275,000 people instead of 309,000 people? Uh, you, you, you could, but the data really supports the 309. This, this is aligning very well with multiple different data sources. So we're looking at it in terms of uh, where do we have good agreement on data, what makes sense, what looks like the uh, concurrence on the projections at least for multiple agencies and this is mm -hmm. uh, this is pretty well supported by what we've seen and, and I, I understand that that's what it could be mm -hmm. but when you look at what the people of Union County are asking for mm -hmm. you know when you look at our 2050 uh, plan and the things you know when when we're our population is asking us to do everything we can to slow it down um, are we going to say full steam ahead uh, and that's just 309,000 people. That's just Union County. That's not counting Monroe. Mm -hmm. uh, so we could be looking at 350,000 people in, in that time. And if we do, several things can affect that economy, um, availability of utilities. A lot of things can have an effect on that. And if, and if you're asking me to approve it or say, great, I don't know that I would want to do that. Okay. I don't know that I'd want to maybe shoot it for a lower number. All right. So I I, board's going to obviously have to give us direction, but I want to point out first, this is a 20 year plan. It's an estimate. Second, it's not actually indicating that you're going to serve 309,000 people with water and sewer. This is just saying that at some point in time, we estimate the population of this county to be minus Monroe over 300,000 people. That doesn't mean you're going to have water and sewer to every one of those individuals. And the other part of it, and I think Jay mentioned this, is that there are other components of the plan where you actually will decide service area. You'll have an analysis of what the actual flows will be anticipated for it. And you will be making decisions that will build a capital plan for how do you accommodate that. So population is just used to get you to a base point, but ultimately you still decide this is an area we're not going to serve. Therefore, water and sewer doesn't go out there, or maybe just water and not sewer. So those are things that I, I just want you to be aware of. 
that if you go too low on the population, you may make it where we're way behind when we do actually need to look at how do we serve that population. It's your decision, but keep in mind this is just a base point. I, I, I don't want you to miss that. Brian, could, uh, I think Jay mentioned it a minute ago, but uh, we're talking about updates, and, and I think you mentioned a 10-year update, but as dynamic as this environment is, are, are, wouldn't we be looking at updates on a more frequent basis to the master plan? I'm glad you brought that up. I actually asked Young about that. We would actually recommend that you do an update in five years, and then we probably do a brand new plan sometime between the five and 10 year mark. It's kind of like your comp plan. We did a comp plan. We just did a brand new comp plan. You don't want to wait too long because the data gets old, it gets stale. Maybe some decisions change, like you know the board doesn't want to extend water into an area that previously you said you did, and then we have to revamp and regroup on that. So we, we think about every five years at least an update, and then a complete overhaul, new plan, in the five to 10 year range after that. That can, would be our suggestion. Can you build into that process? I understand what you're saying about five years, but can you put triggers in that actually may say, we, we've, we've had some years that were just phenomenal. A trigger that says we have to do it sooner than five years. The, I mean, there ought, there ought to be some point that you know that, wait a minute, you know, We'll I, get your, into problem. I get your question. I don't know that we need a trigger. I think honestly what you are looking from us as staff is to come back to you. Number one, annually, we're going to come back to you for a capital improvement program. We have to do that annually. I think what you're looking for us to tell you is when we see things are going faster than what we thought, is to give you a recommendation that we need to do that update sooner than five years. I don't know if there's a trigger you can put in place. We're going to be coming to you with capital improvement programs for you to adopt. That's when you'll know what that annual amount is. And essentially, every year we're looking at this data every year, but we're not doing a full we're not doing a full update. The point I'm trying to make is I don't want to have to ask you where we are. Sure. I want you to be prepared to tell me that I'm nearing this point that I need to take action. I think that annually we can do that based on how we uh, submit our CIP to you and the board can go through that process. I think that's the best way to handle that if you guys are okay with that. Brian, there are triggers in this thing and I, as I look back, you know, history, there was a trigger from 17 to 18 when we went from $11 million revenue to $50 million revenue. That was a huge trigger. And we all kind of miss that. Certainly. Uh, that's five-fold growth. Mm -hmm. And as far as what Commissioner Russian was talking about, you, you got to be mindful of the fact that we have municipal partners that control their own destiny. And because we are their utility <coughs> provider, you've got to go with what their projections show you uh, it don't make us have to do anything, but you're showing us what's going to be expected of us. And yes, so sir. Yes, sir. I understand what you're saying. Well, it, it may not grow this fast, but it probably will. I mean, in those municipalities. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Mr. And, um, you know, we also have our school partners. Mm -hmm. that we have to be concerned with is how fast can they build schools to meet the demands that are being placed on us by our municipal partners. Right. So there's a, there's a lot of things in here that we have to be aware of as a Board of Commissioners. And, and again, the decisions we make on this master plan will direct how Union County will grow for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah, absolutely. And, if, and if, we, if we look at it and, and as a board, and everybody always says, you know, I want to get elected to the Board of County Commissioners so I can help manage growth. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a harder job to do when you have municipal partners and you have the school system and you have all those other things. However, you know, if, if that's what we want to do, uh, these, these are this is the time to make these decisions, not 10 years from now when, we, when, when we're complaining about having to build schools. Mm -hmm. 
you know, five years from now when we're complaining about having to build new schools or something like that nature. So, so again, I, I understand completely our municipal partners, you know, they, they're building fast and they're, they're having trouble keeping up with the amount of growth demand that they have, you know, the number of people. I, I joke a little bit about our rebranding process, Mr. Manager, how uh, we rebranded to attract people to the county and we got people that live here want to stand at the, at, at the border and with a broom and beat them out and keep them away uh, because we're so successful with good schools and low taxes. That was a that was a battle cry to come move to Union County for a long time. So, um, again, the decisions that we make in this, we, we need to understand as a board could have a huge effect on, on what Union County will look like in, in 10 years. All right, Commissioner Simpson. Just help me understand. You say you want this uh, decision made at the meeting on the 19th. Yes, sir. Well, I, I don't want to be one to pull a rabbit out of a hat. So I guess my question is, you say you want us to bless this database. Mm -hmm. What's the alternative? What other, what other database, or how would you come up with that number if we if we didn't bless it? Right. Well, what I would say is the two approaches that make the most sense to me would be either use CRTPO data or use the CRTPO data with the town's data input. They're not substantially different from each other, so you would be making a choice that wouldn't have a huge impact on the master plan. It might make some difference in local pipe sizes, but it wouldn't make a huge difference in what the outcome of the master plan would be in terms of general sizing. But for us to tell you to use 250,000 instead of 309, mm -hmm. that'd just be an arbitrary number that really couldn't be validated in the process. Is that not right? That's correct. Thank you. Commissioner Ray. I have one other question. When you say CT, CRTPO data. Mm -hmm. If they're telling us where the people's going to be, how did they miss the boat on where we've got traffic problems right now? That I can't answer because I don't know what went into the planning. But do you know traffic. what I'm saying? How can we believe their data when they won't respond to facts? Right. Um, I can't answer that. Uh, it, I'm not sure what went into the decisions with what to build in terms of transportation so I can't but you understand my concern about their data I do I do so I know that is a regional model it's not intended to necessarily get down in the granular um, side but all of the municipalities and counties within each one of the CRTPO region were all involved in giving them our land use data, our population projections, and the information that we had available to us. And then they used that to actually create this regional population growth model. And they take the region as a whole, and then they look at how each county and each place fits within that. I'm not gonna tell you it's perfect, but to be perfectly honest, it's better than what we have, and that is guesses. So ultimately, we're going to have to have something to build from, whatever that is. If it's this data, if the board gives us some other direction on it, we still have to build from something to have the plan being able to, to, to you know, I, assume. I agree, but. Yes, sir. If DOT would go down to Potter Road in 84 at 5 o'clock, when school's in session, they would say, we got to do something, and we got to do it now. Well, I, I would say that the population projections were not about funding. It was only about growth. Because, you know, DOT isn't necessarily going to fund based on growth. They're going to fund based on their own decisions. And un we don't control that. And I know that's not you. But yes, I'm sir. Just... Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Rush. Uh, you've got such a valid point. Commissioner Rate, that, or Vice Chairman Rate, that uh, again, DOT doesn't have to fund by these numbers, but yet that's what you're asking us to do is fund by these numbers. Mm -hmm. So you're asking us, whereas DOT are you know, not providing the road funding, we are providing the sewer and water funding. So uh, we're creating a problem on top of a problem, uh, and we are being asked to spend money and resources and treasure to, to make this happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, if they don't use these numbers for their planning, you know, maybe we shouldn't use them for ours, and or maybe we should say, 
well, when when the road money comes, then the, we'll, we'll revisit the sewer plants and the right. and the and the infrastructure to make it happen. The school infrastructure, again, back to the towns. You know, the towns are not putting money into the school system. That right. they're putting money into garbage service and protection, police protection, fire protection, those th kind of things. But as far as the um, school system goes, the county's funding that. So again, that's another resource that we're going to have to do with with a population projection like this. Depending on the type of growth that we have, the type of growth we've been approving in the county has been a lot of uh, less impact on the school type projects mm -hmm. versus um, in the towns. You know, having more maybe single family homes, multifamily homes where where you have young children. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the point you're making is is not lost on me, you know, Vice Chairman Rate. Um, if DOT is not going to use it to fund, how do we use it to fund, or do we just, like you said, uh, Brian, make another direction, make another decision, go in a different direction? Understood. I do believe your numbers, though. Mm -hmm. This is a desirable place to be. Right. I agree, and at least, Brian, I appreciate your explanation because it tells me at least you got a sign, a swag, a scientific wild ass we guess. <laughs> And to just pick numbers out of a hat and say, well, did I call that a wag? That's right. just a wild ass guess. Right. They're not effective. So we need to, we need to, that's why I ask about the reevaluating and sampling during the time because it is a scientific guess. Mm -hmm. So we, we're cognizant of that. One thing we don't want to do is shrink our county. Right. I mean, we've got a very attractive place for people to live. And we want to continue to provide an environment where others feel comfortable to come here. Mm -hmm. And so uh, thank you for your time. Okay. Appreciate y'all's time. Thank you. Okay. Are we switching hats, Brian? I am. Okay. As if you didn't get enough of me already. So. So the next item we have is on the short line extension program. And uh, I, I'm gonna be the, the, the presenter here. And if you have questions, the, the experts will certainly step in and correct me if I'm wrong or if I can't answer the question. But we wanna give you an update. The board had some questions after our meeting on June 21st, some concerns about some of the changes. And it, rightly so, we wanna make sure you understand the program and, and how you wanna move forward with it. So. We're here to sort of go through those things with you. Uh, here's our um, agenda for today. We're just gonna go over some history, talk about when there were updates made to the ordinance for this, and just really go through how we got to where we are today. Um, let's just dive right in. A short line program actually started a long time ago. It had different names. Self-help program back in 2000, 2006. Then it became the modified self-help program from 07 to 11. In 12 is where it became what's really called the existing short loan program. That's the one where we had the backlog and the board directed us to put funds towards the backlog and create the backlog. And, and that's currently what is in effect technically today. And then you have the new program, which is we're going to seek some direction from the board to adopt a new program um, for you to actually implement for our, our residents of the county. Mr. Matthews, yes, sir. We'll move on. Will, yeah. you, will you explain a little bit what the self-help program was? So the self-help program was really more designed for um, individuals would actually provide some level of, uh, they would do some of the work themselves. They would buy some of the materials. There was a cost that they had to incur in order to get these lines extended. They were usually relatively small, not long in length. Um, there was some cost that the county put towards that, but it was really self-help in that they actually did some of the work and some of the, bought some of the materials for it. That then morphed into the modified program where the board actually came up with a, a sort of a flat fee that the county would put towards the project and then everyone else had to pay a portion of it. 
and then from there it became the program which currently exists and that is if you have an applicant that is asking for water and they are a thousand feet or less the county currently paid 100 percent of those costs if you had applicants that were beyond that there may be costs that they would actually have to incur there'd be some cost share but if you had one applicant and they were in less than a thousand feet technically the county could provide that water extension at no cost to those individuals and we had a number of applications that the board uh, actually asked us to go through and do the backlog on. Did that answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay. So um, there's uh, actually an ordinance. The board has actually adopted ordinances. And, and I, I do want to point out that you have actually adopted an ordinance for the new program. We haven't implemented it yet because technically we're still under the old program, the one where we we're getting the backlog over, but you actually have adopted an ordinance for this current, this new program. I want to go through just a few things as far as updates that we've done over the years. So 2012, that was when the self, uh, the uh, program was created, the one that's called the short line program. There was an ordinance put in place for that. In 2018, there was concern expressed about not having a priority for your uh, health hazard projects. It was a first come, first serve basis. And so the board wanted to see two lists and that was created in 18. Then in 2019, we were talking more about a new program to come up with and that's when we asked the, the board really to sort of let's not take any new applications because we need to get this backlog done. We created a ranking system and prioritization which we used in the backlog and it's also part of this new program and that was done in October. And then in December, you actually adopted an ordinance which created the program and it, start, it established a starting date originally of July of 2022 and in that, there was an ordinance for how we actually cost share. In November of 2020, we came back to you, said, listen, we're going to be able to get finished with the backlog faster than what we thought we were going to be able to do it. And so that modification was done for the application period to July of 2021. Obviously, we're in July now, so we haven't started the program, but that was done as ordinance change in November of 2020. Just to give you a little detail of some of the briefings that we've had with the board in March of 18, we talked about the history of this program and the history of other types of programs that are out there. There are different jurisdictions that use a um, special assessment method. There are some that use where there's a contribution that they establish by the applicants, point systems. There's just a, a variety of how other jurisdictions do this, but they do exist. Um, we developed uh, and kept, went over with the board in June the program ranking system, and I'll show you that a little bit later. In August, we talked about how we were going to address the backlog and the whole ranking criteria for that. October, we actually went over the cost share, and this is where I talk about the special assessment process. That was actually the cost share method that was adopted for the new program, a special assessment. And special assessments are, are defined in the general statutes, how they work. And that means every property has to participate in a special assessment. You don't pick and choose. So it's not, I've got five applicants, but I've got 50 property owners and only five applicants participate. All 50 have to participate. That's how special assessment works. Um, so I just want to make that clear to you. Uh, we did an update to you on the backlog in October of 2020, where we were going, how we were doing with that. We also talked about, again, the uh, scoring criteria and the cost share. We did another update of where we were as far as the backlog in March of 2021. Same thing in April. And then uh, last month is where we had the discussion about some of the changes that were being presented to the board and you, you, you raised some concerns that you wanted to have more information and, and that's where we are today. I have a question. Yes, sir. Are we going to hear something later on in the presentation about the cost share amount? Yes, sir. Okay. So, program overview, existing new, 2012 to 2021, 2021 to whenever. Originally, it was one day only for applications, July 1. 
you got your application in and it was put in the hopper, uh, it was first come, first served. There was only a certain amount of money set aside for it originally. On the new program, it's estimated you'd have a 60-day application period for people to apply and make applications. Then we have to score them. That's one of the reasons why we have at least a defined um, application period because we have to score those, bring them back to the board, and then the board has to make decisions on are we going to fund all of the applications, some of them, what are you going to do because that's a board decision. Also the previous, um, pro the previous program allowed for backlogs. This one is no backlog. If you're not approved, you just have to reapply the next year. That's the way that works. And then the previous one, as I said before, the county paid 100% of the cost of an applicant that was in the first 1,000 feet. Under the new program, it is recommended that there be a cost share for all those individuals. So let's, I'll get a little bit more detail with you. I told you about the program thing. Some of the, um, some of the decisions that we'll have to make in the future is how do we actually implement this new program? Uh, previously, it was anticipated we'd do a 30-day uh, sort of an advertising period before the opening day, and then you'd have 60 days of application time. We recognize that the board wants to get this out as quickly as possible. We are behind, so we certainly could do an advertisement of that almost immediately and start taking applications relatively soon, but extend that application period for 90 days. We could certainly do something like that. But those are some decisions we're gonna need the board to make uh, in the upcoming meeting. We're not asking you to take any decisions today, but July 19th, we will be asking the board to make some decisions as far as this goes. All right, so let's talk about the ranking criteria. Uh, what you have on the backlog that is the previous criteria we use for the backlog applications. And you'll see at the, at the bottom, age of request. That was because we were trying to get rid of the backlog and give points to those individuals who had applications that were there a long time. The future, you don't need that. That's not a relevant point number. So we've eliminated that because it's not relevant anymore. And we've gone to a 100 point scale because I think it's easier to manage. If you'll see, we reduced the points for participa participation rates and for system benefits, and we got eliminated the age of request because that's not relevant anymore. So what that's done is actually made the water quality component of it, it's actually made that more weighted. It's, it actually has a better weight to it for an application. Um, we think this is a, a better way to do it. Obviously, the board can give us direction if you want to see something done differently. Brian, um, yeah. if I can ask, um, sure. are the, is major contaminant and minor contaminant, is that either or, or could you qualify on both counts? Both. You can actually have both. You get up to 40 points. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yes, sir. And I'm going to talk about how that works in just a second because there, there is a sliding scale because you want to have applications that have one at well that has issues. You, you don't necessarily, they shouldn't score as high as a neighborhood that has 15 that have contaminated wells. You want to be able to compare them and say, okay, well, which one am I going to serve first? Am I going to serve the one with 15 or one with one? Or both, you could. Well, there's a scale that I'll show you in a minute. That's this right here. And we use this scale under the current backlog. I don't want you to think this is new. It's not. We use this scale system when we gave you the points for the backlog system. So you could decide who, who was going first, who was going second. Uh, so, for water quality, major, if you have 25% or greater of the applicants who ha can show that they have a major contaminant, then they can get 25 points. If you have 24% to 10%, you get 20 points. So again, it's giving weight to where you have more people in the application that have those major contaminants. You also can score points the same way if you have a minor. So an individual who has a well test, and that's part of the program, we want you to have a well test, you can submit those results so we have that information to compare. If they have both major and minor, those are points that they can actually add to their application. Uh, then you have your water quantity, that means I can't produce enough gallons per minute for my well. 
that obviously gains points as well. And then you have your customers per mile, your cost per customer, and your potential rate, participation rate. Those are what is the cost and the efficiency of it. And then ultimately, last but not least, does it have some system benefit? Does it create a loop? Does it do something that has more of a benefit for the system? Any questions about how the sliding scale works? Yes, sir. Yes, right. I have one. Let's say we, we have 10 customers on a section of line, and four of them have major contaminants, mm -hmm. and four of them don't have any. Now, I don't understand Captain Goff and Captain's Choice, but if you've got four that's major contaminants, and if you add in the other six that don't have them, that's going, that is going to less the score for that run. No, sir. So, again, you're comparing applications to applications. So, if you have an application for 10 people, and they are, let's just say it's a mile, okay? And then you have another application for 10 that's a mile. Well, of this application has 10 per mile, there are four people who have results that they have major contaminants in their well. They get the maximum of 25 points for that application. Over here, you've got the, ap the application that has 10, but only one of those applicants has a major contaminant. Instead of them getting total of 25 points, they're going to get, uh, I believe it's 15 points. So the application that has more wells that are contaminated is getting a higher point score. So you're giving them a better weight for that. But I'm sitting here playing numbers game. Let's say the 10 over here has got minor contaminants. Then they get only the minor score. They points. get 150 times. No. Is it rated per house or per line? It, it's per application. So if well, you what have. What is the application? Is that per? It, it's, however many, it's however many people applied for in that section. If you have a one mile section and only 10 people were applicants, then it's those 10 people in that one mile section. And if only four of them major contamination. They get the full point score. Because that they're application. That application, yes, sir. They get the full point score. So it's based on application. Now, and understand. I'm confused there. That's 100 points. The other one, 10. No, 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 no. 25 total, sir. 25 total. Because it's based on it's how many million. of your total um, applicants had that scale. So they get 25 points. The only, the only ones get 15 total. You're adding up to a total of 100 points per application. You're not going to go over 100 points. It's getting it to see how close to 100 points does each application get. So one application may get 90 points. Another one may get 50 then you decide, well, am I going to fund both of them or I'm going to make the one that 50 weight because you, you don't have as much issues as the one that has and they have a 90 point score. That's a board decision later once we've given you the scoring criteria. Does that, did I answer your question? Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, you said something earlier about how if we have um, a thousand feet that we run that currently if currently if you have an application uh that's less than a thousand feet and they have one applicant then the county the county will conceivably run that at no cost to the to the applicant to anybody to, just to the well government. understand no that's extremely expensive and the rate payers are paying for that so in the past obviously we encouraged there be more applicants than just one in a thousand feet because if, if you have like, like we get regularly comments from people that say, I can see the fire hydrant. Mm -hmm. So if they're within a thousand feet. They could apply. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And, and under the current program, they could have made an application. Now, keep in mind, the previous application had only a certain amount of money to it. The board only put like $600,000 to it. So it didn't go very far. And then recently you put a lot more money to it. Well, 
we kept the applications as they were because we didn't want to add more and more and more to it. We wanted to get those done and then get the board to give us direction on a new program. So none were added at a certain point. So when you got a group of people that are paying to extend the line, and, and what, I'm, what I'm envisioning is Brian Matthews Road, 10 houses on Brian Matthews Road. Mm -hmm. And you've got a mile, 5,000, couple hundred 5, feet. 5,280 feet. Right. Yes, sir. So, so you're going, if you've got 10 houses, that's about 500 feet per house if, if they're spaced out evenly. Yeah. Yes, and sir. we would just, if they came in and applied, we would just run that line for free? The board has to make those final decisions, not us. Right. Again, that, the information for who you actually um, ag agree to fund that, that goes to the board. That, that's not a staff decision. Right. But, but, but conceivably, policy, yes, that could be done. Policy right now. Under right. the current program, absolutely. And you have, um, how much money did we spend? We, we allocated $5 million, yes, right? Sir. How much of that $5 million did we spend? Because you said we had some savings. Yeah, so we allocated t uh, 15 really, 5, 5, and 5. Right. Um, it, it appears that we're going to be a little, uh, well, again, we haven't finished the bidding for the, uh, this 2020 um, phase, but we estimate we're going to be about $9.2 million out of the total $10 million. So we, we think we're going to have anywhere from a six hundred to 800000 savings. And we won't know that until the bids come in on these last projects, but we're estimating we're going to have some savings on that. And that money goes right back into the to next, that program. next program for yes, that, that program for that year. Yep. Unless so, the board redirects it, that money goes into the program. So we wouldn't just say uh, use that money to, to make a finish a loop somewhere Only could if could actually the, put it closer to people. Only if the board directs us to do that. We cannot at the staff level move that money from the short line program to another program. Right. The board has to direct us to but do that. But it stays in the program. So you have that much more the next year? Yes, sir. So you have $5,600,000 yes, next year? Yes, sir. Okay. More questions? All right. You, this is where you were asking that question, and I thought I was right. So the estimated cost, $9.2 million. Total footage we've done, th this is total for everything or total for what we've done? Total. total for everything. So about 18.5 miles, that's our cost. Total applicants. This is important. I want you to see this. Union County Public Works Utility, that means your rate payers are paying approximately $50,000 per applicant to run water to those individuals. That's not cheap. I want y'all to understand that. That is something the system's been doing. Out of the 184 applicants, there were a total of 562 that could have been served, but they didn't sign on. They might at some point in the future, but they did not as part of this application. And there are some costs that those folks did have to pay that were in the free section, they had to pay a tap fee, they had to pay the meter set fee. So there was some cost that they did have to incur, but there wasn't a system cost share fee that they had to pay. So, Brian, I have yes, a sir. question. Yes, sir. On that FY19 through FY21, how many fiscal years does that represent? Three? It's, I believe it's two because we were able to get it done in two fiscal years. If I'm not mistaken. But, it's two, if I'm not mistaken. But when we first authorized it, didn't we authorize five, five, and five? We did, but that's because we had um, what we estimated was nearly $15 million in projects. However, many, a number of those projects were not free. So when I say 1,000 feet, there was a cost share if you went beyond that amount. If you went beyond that length and you didn't have enough applicants, there was a defined cost share that those applications would have to have. When we actually calculated that and sent that to those applicants, they pulled out and said, I don't want it if I have to pay for that. And so only the applications with the exception, I think, of one, two, I'm sorry, two, where they had some cost share, all the rest of those are within that free component where they did not have a cost share that they had to pay. So that's why we were able to actually get it done in two years because we had almost $5 million worth of projects decide they didn't want to contribute any cost share to it. 
So we've got $5.8 million in surplus going over the new program. Well, I mean, it, well yes. it was anticipated that that money would roll into this program. Yes, sir. Absolutely. 5.8 instead of I mean, however you want to look at it. Sure. It, it just anticipated it would just all stay in that program. Okay. All right. So new program. Again, I think I, uh, I did. Tom, would you go back to the previous? This one? Or the one? Yes, sir. Yeah, and you actually have the PowerPoints there. So if you want to have it, you actually, we made copies for everyone if you need that as well. It's all right. All right, can I move on? Go ahead, sir. All right, so. What's adopted currently, obviously the board's gonna have to you know, give us direction, make changes, whatever it is you wanna do, but for the new program, what was adopted was a special assessment program. That means that every single property owner would have to participate in the cost. Now, it was not anticipated that the board was going to require 100% payback. It was anticipated that annually the board would make a decision on what the cost share percentage would be for the new project. Is it 20 percent, 30, 50? At some point in time, the utility would have a component share of it, but the applicants themselves would have a payback that they would be responsible for. And that is how the special assessment program would work. It's actually defined by the general statutes. But we'd go through that process and then annually those folks would have a, a payment on their tax bill that was for their special assessment to cover their portion of whatever that cost was. If the board said it's 20%, then 20% of their project cost, they would be whatever their share is, they would have to pay that. And every property owner along that stretch of pipeline would have to pay their proportionate share under a special assessment program. Let me ask you a question concerning mm -hmm. that. You got 1,000 feet. Mm -hmm. There's 10 residents in that 1,000 feet. Okay. One of them is asked. But you, what you're saying is all 10 will have to pay that special assessment. When do they get a vote on so, whether or not so, they want to do no, it? No, that's, that's a good point. So under the application process, that's where we provide you with the information that, well, out of those 10, out of those 10 possible folks, only one asked for it. And the board could then make a decision we're not gonna fund this application. You don't have enough participation. You didn't go out and get enough people on your street to wanna to be part of this. So therefore, as a board, we're gonna say no. You need a little bit more homework, Mr. Homeowner, Mrs. Homeowner. Go talk to your neighbors, get them involved in this, and then come back and see if you have a better participation rate. Or the board could say, yeah, we're gonna fund it. But you're gonna to have to pay a part of it. Absolutely. I would not anticipate the board would make a decision if one person out of 10 was saying, I want the water. It would be my, I would probably expect you would say, no, you guys need to do more homework and come back to us. But you could if you wanted to. How do I tell? We said health and safety was one of the most important things to us. And that applicant has a major problem with their, and a minor with their will. Mm -hmm. How do we accommodate helping people in that situation? So th there are other options, and, and I'm not advocating one over the other, but keep in mind that there are ways to treat and filter wells. What you can't do is give people more water if they don't have enough water. If the well doesn't produce enough water and you can't find it, I, that's, that's a different animal. But if you have contaminants in your wells, there are ways to treat and filter them. I'm not saying they're cheap. But there is a way to do it, and those individuals can do it. It's just we have to educate them, and we try to. If those folks contact, if they let us know that they have questions, we will meet with them. We'll tell them what their options are. Certainly, we will not, you know, recommend a system. We'll recommend that here's how you can do it. Well, I'd, I'd like to see some of that information because this county is considered a wealthy county. There's a lot of people in this county that aren't wealthy and they don't need to be left behind with tainted water uh, if, we've got a, if we've got an avenue to, to address it. Sure, and, and I don't so, know if, if you recall uh, with Patrick, 
uh, we're actually working on a CDBG community development block, block grant program where we're going to try to use some of those funds to help those individuals who are lower income individuals with a well program because there are places in the county it's going to be a long time before we can get water to them and rather than make them wait there's ways that we can help them get some tr you know, better treatment for their wells through this program that I, I know we're working on. We're not there yet. How close are we, Patrick? Uh, we're finalizing that. I think it was Commissioner Rape who asked that when we brought the program back that it be in its final form. Um, so to Brian's point, uh, we are anticipating putting about $100,000 into what we're calling the CDBG well program. And the CDBG program is for low to moderate income individuals, so you'd have to be below that threshold to qualify. Um, also to Brian's point, there are some areas of this county, even with the short line, that probably won't see water in the near future, so trying to get those folks a treatment uh, process at their home to address the contaminants is our ultimate goal. Um, it, it, there are a bunch of different ways wells can be contaminated. Um, some have to do with the actual structure of the well casing, some have to do with the, the ground contaminants. So it, it really is uh, individual treatment systems for those individual homes. So we are hoping to have that um, in, in place about the short the time, the short time, short line program goes out as well. And, and, and what I'm hoping you hear from this is that we heard what you were saying about wanting to get help people out who have these issues so we're trying to come up with multifaceted ways to help people get wells that are good quality water or public water however we can do it we're coming up with options and ways to, to, to provide that well, you mentioned something that uh, about the wells that don't produce mm-hmm uh, I know in our planning process, you have to get a permit to build, build a home. Yes, sir. One of, there was a situation in one of our short lines we've run so far that they built the house, then they drilled a well and found out there was no water. Yes, sir. Can we include in our permitting process that you have to have either access to the public or you have to have a functioning well to build? I mean, because you actually you need, right. I'm getting ready to build right now. I'm getting ready to drill a well because I'm 120 foot from the water. So that's an excellent question. And, and our, um, our planning committee and our folks have thought about this. And, and certainly, if locally you want to adopt requirements that they actually have to have their well in place and tested, um, I think you can do that. I don't know that I'd recommend you do that. Um, while it makes sense to me because if I was going to build a house, I'd want to know I won't have good quality water. But it's exciting to build a house. It's not exciting to build a well. So the well is almost always the last thing that people do. They just do it that way. But didn't they just change? We're part of the uh, finalization for selling a home. So what we ended up doing is uh, it, not for selling a home, that's, that's too challenging. For new homes, we actually do require them to have that well test information for them to provide them with, here are the contaminants that you're going to have to deal with in your well. And you understand you're choosing to use this as a water source. We're not forcing them to stop because we actually can't. The state does not allow us to tell people they can't use a well. That's the bad part about it. So if they dig a well and they get water out of it, they can drink it. What we're trying to do is educate them, let them know up front. If the board wants us to explore having it be a requirement that you have a well di done first before you can even move forward to building permit, I mean, certainly we can explore that. What we found is that we think that that would be um, a lot more challenging and it, you may get a lot of pushback on that because there's more challenges than you think. You've got to have your septic system in a certain place, your well has to be in a certain place, then your house. And so all of that plays into where everything goes. And if you start mandating certain components of it, then you, you can affect where everything else can be built. So we're happy to explore it and we did discuss it we just unfortunately felt like that was something that might be more challenging for the board to to bite off what was truly amazing i found when we were talking doing the short line extension and i i have to thank the manager for stepping up and, and funding the program to get it fixed is that most people most people don't even 
They don't want to get their well tested. I think they're afraid to find out what they, what, what they may have. Uh, yes, sir. I, I know that I had a personal friend who said never had it tested. I suggested that he did. He came back heavy arsenic. And uh, I, yes, I can't remember his name because probably I had some of that, but that's what it affects. <laughs> I'm being facetious. I know he's Gary's name. But. Well, and, and we, we recognize that. I think that's why we, we felt like adding the component that you're going to have those tests. We're going to provide you with the results. We're going to give you the options for how you can filter and treat that water. So you're making an informed decision when you're building a house and going to live in a home that's going to be served by a well. After the fact, when a house is already built, that's a bit more of a challenge to force that. That's true. Commissioner Rushing. Thank you. Um, and we're, you know, another thing that people don't think about unless they've lived on uh, a well is that when your power goes out with a Hurricane Hugo. You don't have water. Or yeah, you, don't, you, you don't have water. So it's, a, yeah. it's, a, it's an issue of safety and health beyond just the, the you know, arsenic or anything in the well. Certainly. There's an issue with fire protection. You know, people who have fire hydrants near their homes have lower insurance rates. Yes, uh, sir. There, there's a lot of benefits to it and having it around the county that, that right. beyond that. And one thing that I would ask you to do, and I saw, I saw your number of the, how much it costs per applicant. Yeah, I'm um, going to get to that. I mean, I can keep going or how? Yeah, well, I just real quick, if you could provide us some information, like with sewer, mm -hmm. uh, when we build sewer, um, we are subsidizing that with the rate payers. There's a cost to that as well. So like if you could come up with a number, uh, the $50,000 per customer for water, what's the rate payer paying uh, per applicant on sewer? And I know there'll be a less number because the builder's putting in the infrastructure and things okay. like that. However, there is a cost to it. So I'd be curious just to know that number. If you could get that number on water, you should be able to get that number on we'll the sewer project. We'll see what we can do on that one. A little, little bit different scenario, but we can certainly dig into it, see what we can get for you. Yes, right. sir. All right, so uh, again, that's the current program, it's a special assessment. There also is a cost per foot component to that. That was really put in there, so if you had a very, very small project, maybe on a couple of houses, a couple of hundred feet, they wouldn't do a special assessment, they would just pay a cost per foot. The county would pay its, the utility would pay its share, they would pay their share, and it would just be run that way, because it's just simpler. When you have larger groups, the special assessment just made more sense, and that's why it was that way. Um, however, we're sensitive. We understand that the board has concerns with being affordable for folks. And I will tell you in these special assessments, um, even if you did it at 20%, it's probably going to add up to be more than $3,500 that someone would have to pay because the cost of running a line is not inexpensive. So it's likely it could be more than $3,500 total if you were doing a, a, a special assessment. But we recognize those were concerns, so we talked about offering the board a flat fee component. What would that do? How would we handle that? And so we came up with a $3,500 flat fee. There's no special number to that. that. That honestly, we were looking at what would it be if it were the Roughly about 25, 20%, that's probably not quite 20%, but if we were getting close to 20%, what would that number be? That's somewhere in the range. If everyone had to pay 3,500, not four or five out of, out of 50, that's everybody was being involved in that. That would be close. So that's kind of how we came up with that number, but it's, it's, it's not special that that number can't change, obviously. Uh, talk about the fees and what the fees would ultimately be. So applicants, they pay the cost share fee, whatever that's established at. They pay a meter fee, which is the meter set fee. Right now, I believe that's 227, 272, 272. And then they would pay a system development fee if it's applicable, meaning if they have a vacant piece of property, they have to pay a system development fee when they're going to develop their property. That's just the nature of the way the beast is. Future connections, what they would pay, well, they'd have to pay a tap fee, they have to pay their meter set fee, and they'd also have to pay their system development fee. And then just to give you an example, so if you had an existing home and they were an applicant, what would their cost be? $3,772.50.
but you had an existing home and they weren't an applicant. They said, I don't want to be part of the application. Well, their cost is $1,342.50, or 50 cents. It is lower because they're not paying a cost share. So technically they're getting water at a much lower cost because they didn't pay a cost share. Same thing holds true for undeveloped land. You didn't have a house there and you were gonna build a house at some point in the near future, what would your cost be? $6,972.50 for someone who's an applicant and $4,542.50 for a non-applicant. Now, we show you this because I want you to understand in trying to be more economical for those applicants, you're actually making it where those folks who are an applicant are getting a better deal. So you're, you're going to incentivize people to not be applicants. Why, why should I be an applicant? I'm going to pay less. But we recognize you have heartburn about how much it costs for people to get water. So we're just trying to offer you solutions here. Now, how much is, how much is a, a thousand foot cost to install a pipe? I think we estimated it at $95 a linear foot, so that runs out, what, about $100,000? Uh, uh, and and that's, that's barring we don't hit any complications, no other issues, roughly about $100,000 for 1,000 foot of pipe. So with, with 1,000, if there are 10 people plus the applicant, or nine people plus, plus the applicant, you're talking about $49,855. If about you, half of it. If you're talking about. If you got 10 people. If you got 10 people, yes, sir. Yeah, if you got 10 people. Now, if you had, you know, less, then obviously you get less. Yes, sir. Brian, when these bids have come in, it would have the f footage for the line. And it does the have the footage, yes, sir. And none of those were $95 a foot. Uh, I'm, I'm less. The 95 includes all the engineering services. It, it includes all the engineering services. It includes everything. He it includes all the costs, engineering costs, all the soft costs, all the hard costs. When we awarded the contracts, most of them surprised me. They ran like $50 a foot. Right. Well, understand, we still have to pay for engineering and all the soft costs. Those still have to be paid for. So we're giving you the, the, the estimate of the cost based on all of those costs because, that again, it's not free to do the engineering and the construction management. Is and that done in-house or out-of-house? Uh, we've done that out-house, out-house. Out <laughs> we've done that outside, outside. When the program was much smaller, we were able to do that in-house because it was much smaller. We weren't doing that many applications. But when you decided you wanted to do all of it, we couldn't do all of that in-house. We had to go out and have consulting services for that. And I had asked you previously about this cost share of 3500 and I was under the impression that you have a new number to throw at us, but I hadn't no, seen it change. I, I don't have a new number, sir. I don't know what you mean by a new number. Um, the board can certainly say we want a different number. Absolutely. We want a different number. <laughs> okay. hey, that, that can be something, as we'd like to say, as long as you tell, give us direction, we're going to implement whatever your direction is. So there's nothing magical about that. If the board wants different numbers, keep in mind, though, the rate payers are going to be subsidizing folks to get water. As long as you know that and you accept that, that's fine. Okay. On here it says an, a non-applicant's $1,342.50. Yes, sir. I would support that for both sides. Applicant and non-applicant. It's you guys give us the direction. You tell us what the number is. Because this thirty-five hundred never came from us. Well, remember that originally what was adopted was a special assessment, meaning that they were going to pay whatever the share the board decided at that time. It was everyone pays, and if you established a twenty percent payback then their share would be 20% of what that cost would be. So this was just a way to give you an option that was not a special assessment option. All I can say personally, we need to go back to the drawing board. Certainly. Uh, especially concerning you want to, you know, these other, the other nine people may be doing without food to, to make ends meet and we're going to tell them they own a So a guy down the street can get some water and get water. I understand. It, it's, it, we've got to find a better way. Commissioner Rushing, you wanted to say something? Uh, yes. 
with with these is there a way we've talked about before a way that people could pay monthly in their water bill so uh, is so there a way of doing that where they could compensate the county over time so, so the special assessment is the easiest way for us to do that because it's already set up that way mm -hmm. I, I would tell you we're not a financial institution and we don't need to be in the financial institution business and making loans to people they can get loans from other places that's that's not our business if you have special assessment it's set up we can do it that way because we already know how to do it that way it's challenging for us to try and do this as a monthly payment for folks on their water bill and i would not recommend it obviously you can give us whatever direction you want to give us and we'll figure it out I would highly suggest we don't become a financial institution to loan people money. And, and I would point out there is a there is a bright and shiny thing on the horizon. <laughs> we got forty six point five million dollars coming from the federal government. That is true. Yes, that sir. We could use for a water extension. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. I personally would support helping them out, let them pay for it in time. It's whatever direction the board gives us. That's why I think we need to go back to the drawing board, spend some time. That's one of the good things about our two-on-ones that we have. We get to have this dialogue. People get to express uh, their concerns and or, and or suggestions. So uh, I think we need, need to go back on this. I, I, was, I, I was really taken away really, when I saw this. this and, uh, yes, sir. Because, you know, you mentioned their special assessment you know the details that you don't know what yeah kind of it, I, I can exp i can understand that until i have an example in front of that's you correct. that's hard for you to like really get what is and, and and that's that's on us we did not give you examples for you to see how that works and i, I apologize but we'll, all we want is the board to say how you want to do it if you want it to be x then that's what we'll do that's, true. that's what we're here for Commissioner Rush. real quick with your your specific example because it, it it made me think you're 125 feet away from the hydrant uh i'd have to come down 125 foot and i don't i'd have to apply for the short line i don't know what the well's going to be mm -hmm. i can't apply until i know what it's going to be right. so i'm gonna drill a well right but, and, but if he but if he came in for the thing he would be under the new home because you haven't built yet right? yeah yeah so so it would be 69 or 45 which would be cheaper than a well. Well, th that that would, but that's not taking into consideration competing with the people that need it. I may not need it, but you might get it close to somebody next near you that does. That, well, every, no, it, every extension moves it further down the line. It, it does absolutely, and, and of course, like I said, the, the and, and I'm not saying I, I apologize. I'm not meaning. I'm just saying in your example, if I were going to build a house and I were a oh, building, I'd much yeah. rather have water. Yeah, I right. mean I, clear, I would, clearly, well, it, but it, I. Uh, one of the things that it just doesn't show on here, and, and that's because I just don't, I, I don't have the data to be able to tell you, is there is a cost that they're going to have to pay a plumber to run the line to their house. We don't include that because that's not part of, we run it to the right of way. After that, from the meter to your home is your cost. I can't tell you what those costs are going to be. So there is a cost that, that a property owner is going to have to pay to a private um, plumber to be able to do that work that's just not included in here because we don't do that work but you're you're right ultimately um, as a line gets moved it just gets easier for someone else to do it in the current scenario and 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 I'll be the first one to tell you in the current scenario it, it almost incentivizes you not to apply because it's less money so again, if the board wants to give us direction that it's a lower cost, if you want to continue the program as it is, we just need to understand how you want to accomplish the program. And you have a bucket of money. It doesn't mean that if you get 10 applications that you can't say, I'm funding all 10 of them. I, it doesn't matter that I'm only serving one customer and I'm running in a mile to serve the one customer. I'm going to pay to do it. You can do that. It's, it's your bucket of money to make app decisions. Now, what comes a problem is if you have more applications than you have money, well, then you got to figure out what you're doing. That's what I, we're just recovering from. Right. Now, I'm not anticipating we're going to have that happen, but, you know, we've been fooled before. So. Well, good thing is in 10 years, we've got another million people here. 
three oh nine or whatever it is <laughs> we're gonna be. Okay. Add ten more. All right. Um, so you know, we had some certain things that were done. We've, these are some things that we're going to need the board's direction on. When do we start an application process? What do we do as far as cost share? Is it a flat fee? Is it not a flat fee? And then when are those due? How do we, how, how are they paid? Those are all things we're going to need decisions on. And it sounds to me, and I, I just, I'm reading the room, that we're not going to get that decision on July 19th. So I anticipate that what we may need to do is have work sessions with the board and actually work through this program and have you give us what you want those parameters to be. Because right now, we don't have any other options to present you until you can tell us as a board, this is what we want. You, uh, well, we're supposed to do open enrollment July 1st, which we haven't started. That's correct, that's yes, sir. That's for next year. It is, yes, sir. Okay, so if we even delay that another 30 days, 60 days, really is not going to impact next year yet. We're far, far enough ahead to, of the process. We have the funding. All we want to do, obviously, is we want to be able to have enough time to score the applications, have that data back to you so you can decide what applications you're going to fund or not fund or all of them. And then we can start with engineering, start with design, and then construction to start sometime afterwards. So if the board wishes to push that out, that's fine. What we don't want to do is advertise a program that we don't have the details for. And, and that's, that's why we didn't advertise for July 1. We just didn't have the details to be able to tell folks, do you have a cost share? What is that cost share? We, we just couldn't tell them that. So we felt that it would be improper for us to put an application out. Any other questions? Any more questions about short line? Sure. Commissioner Simpson. Yes, sir. Uh, this is uh, actually related to uh, practically everything we've talked about. Um, going back to our uh, water one-on-one -on -one with Barry, we remember you got to got to have a source, you got to have customers, you got to have transmission lines. I think uh, staff knows that the priority is to provide as many underserved customers in this county as we can now that we have a, a, a new source or an additional source uh, for mm -hmm. water well, what is what is as a part of this uh, master plan or are, are there strategies being put together in terms of looking at where those transmission lines might go where are there pockets of uh, customers that it would make it I know it's business so it would make it uh, economical to deliver water to that area? Sure. Is that being done or how so, do you yes, plan sir, to get that done? That we're looking at both the water and the sewer components of, you know, where where is it easier for us? Now, I'm not going to tell you we're going to catch everything because we're not, uh, but we, we are going to be looking at, you know, are there areas that make a system benefit for making a loop and tying in more folks, extending to a certain point to get rid of a dead end? Because obviously, Poor water quality can occur in a public water line just like it can in a well. You leave it in the, in the line too long, it becomes poor water quality. So yes, sir, we are looking at those things as far as part of the master plan. Now what the master plan doesn't do is it doesn't dictate when you'll do that. It, it may lay out a, a, a plan for how you do it, but the board has to then set aside funding to do it and you have to say, I wanna do it this year and I want to do it this year so that then we can then put that in a CIP. So, so for information purposes, when might staff be able to provide us with that plan, that uh, expectation, whether it's one year, 10 years, 20 years, of what that might look like? Well, that, so your, your master plan is, is probably going to be the <coughs> best detail that we can give you at the time. It's not going to be perfect, but you will have that. In, I think we're anticipating that in March of 22? March of 22 is when the uh, final master plan will be done, but the alternatives analysis that will show where we will serve is going to be more like late fall or early winter. Okay. okay. Thank you. Did that answer your question, sir? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, thank you. All right. You guys done with the water and the, the short line program? Okay. Well, I'm you want, gonna, Unless you want to go over some more. Well, I, I, I think <laughs> you guys have done a fine job. So. Uh, we got a request to have a uh, five-minute break. break, so we'll we'll break them.
Mr. Manager, you ready? All right, we'll resume. Mr. Matthews. All right. So last topic here was the uh, interlocal agreement with municipalities, and this is concerning about water and sewer. So previously the board had given us some direction that you wanted us to approach our municipalities uh, concerning um, our commodity of water and sewer, and, and Commissioner Williams likes to call it a scarce commodity, and it is a scarce commodity. It is absolutely that. And how could we come up with a way to, to be more collaborative in our efforts with our municipality? So back in December of 2019, I sent a draft of an interlocal agreement to all of our municipalities with the exception of Wingate, Marshville, and Monroe. That's because we have other arrangements for water and sewer with those jurisdictions. But the, the other ones, we sent the, a copy of an interlocal agreement for them to give us some feedback to. And that, that we gave them till basically the end of January, just give us some feedback. And then the, the manager and I actually did on a, went on a traveling road trip and, and we met with most of those municipalities to talk about the interlocal agreement and the purpose behind it, what we were trying to accomplish, and, and ask them how would they like to move forward with that. Obviously, that was during the pandemic, and we certainly didn't make as much progress as we would have liked because we were a little slow with that. But fast forward, um, we thought the best way to approach this was to actually take our three um, municipalities that are usually our higher growth municipalities and really focus on discussing with them how could we have an interlocal agreement. And so we, we gave them the, obviously their, the draft and we, we met with them individually to talk about their concerns, their, their wants, their needs, those types of things. And, and so it's up until this point, we have had three, and I believe I'm correct, three iterations of where we have sent a, a, a draft interlocal agreement to them saying the, these are our comments based on feedback that we've gotten from the municipalities. We've met with them twice in person. We've communicated on a number of times by phone, by email. But essentially what it's led to is what you have here is the last version that the county has provided to the municipalities with our recommended basically language for that. And uh, you know, there are some things in there that the municipalities may have some questions about, but we had our concerns as well. I think it's fairly close to what the municipalities would be willing to, to agree to. But at this point in time, they have it, and we haven't really talked about what their questions would be after this final draft. So what I'm going to do is just sort of go through the major sections. I'm not going to go through each section. Some of them really are not necessary. But I'm going to go through the major sections and, and see if the board has any feedback, any questions, any concerns, so that we can hopefully move forward to completing this. So let's see here. So obviously you have the purpose, sections one, and it's really just talking about our roles as the municipality and the county and, and, and water and sewer. We also talk in number two that you know, we are going to be the provider of water and sewer um, utility for those municipalities in their jurisdiction. And, and we talk about what that is and what that means and, and can specify that. Section three is where we really get into how municipalities are treated when they themselves are um, wanting to extend water and sewer to a project of their choice. It could be land that they own, that water and sewer just needs to be extended to it because they own the land. It could be that they feel that there's a development project that they just think is the right thing to do and they want water and sewer extended to that project. And so how, how does that get funded? How is that paid for? And it's really talking about there's sort of two, two ways, really. One is through the collaboration of our master plan and our ultimate CIP, if a project is included 
in our CIP and it's funded, then the county be, will be responsible for building that project. Because obviously we've identified that that is something that is a benefit to the system, so the municipality doesn't have any cost share for that because it's already built into the idea of the system improvement. However, if there's a circumstance where it's not in the CIP, it's not funded, then there's a, a mechanism where the municipality could receive some funding um, payback for that. And the way this is structured is that the municipality would fund the total cost of the extension and then over a period of time, revenues that we collect, monies that we have, we would pay back the municipality a proportionate share of those. And the way this one is set up is that we would go to no more than 50% of the total cost. That's, that's the maximum. They could get up to 50% of the total cost of what it was to actually install that line. Um, and that would be over a 15-year period. So it's, it's anticipated it annually. We would just, how much money did we collect? What is, what is the component of that that we're using as far as methodology to figure out that amount? And we pay them that amount. And then the next year is the same thing. Who connected? How much money did we collect from that? That money then goes to them until we either A, we get to 50% and we're at max, or B, we get to 15 years and we're done. We're not collecting, we're not giving them any more share of the funds after that period of time. Now, someone asked the question is like, well, you know, how, how did you come up with that rationale? It's not free for us to own and maintain a line. Just because someone puts it in doesn't mean there isn't a cost that we're going to have with that over time. There's a cost to operate it, there's a cost to own it, fix it, maintain it. And so ultimately, we're building into it that there is a cost that we're going to have to incur uh, with whatever is put in, sewer, water, whatever that may be. And, and that's how that is actually established. Um, uh, yes, sir. Commissioner mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of confused at this because, so if it's a, if it's a town, hall town hall and they need sewer run to the town hall is that what we're talking about reimbursing them for because if it's a housing development in a town the builder puts all that in the builder pays for it a absolutely what we're talking about here in most cases most cases it will be municipality owns a piece of property they want to build a new town hall they want to build a public works building whatever it is they want to build they need water extended to it it's not in our plan to extend water to it okay we're giving them an option for how we can help somewhat subsidize that cost for the municipalities they should they pay it pay it up front they can get some reimbursement for that in the future because there are people that would connect to that over time and that's what that's built for but it, we're absolutely not talking about a development project like so, a housing apartment complex you're absolutely promising no 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 me. i i i, that, I got said, a bible up here somewhere i'm sure so hold on hold on <laughs> that's the that is predominantly how we expect it will be used that doesn't mean that a municipality couldn't make a decision and say I really think that this project let's just say it's an industrial project I don't know let's just say it's an industrial project let's and say they it's an feel apartment complex. okay you can say it's an apartment complex and they feel that it's so important to the municipality that they're willing to put some of their money into it and we don't oh. have to pay them back half of it. That's the way this is structured, yes, sir. Absolutely. Now, obviously the board can say that's, that's not how we'll do this. We'll only do it for property that the municipality is building themselves. But when this was put together, we recognize that there are times when there are projects where municipalities may feel that it's important. Now, whether or not they want to look at the developer and say, Mr. Developer, that's all on you, that's your cost, and they can step away from it, that's fine. But there may be circumstances where there is a private project that the municipality feels strongly enough that they're willing to be a cost share component to that. Would, yeah. would they have enterprise fund money? There's a, no, there's certainly the municipality didn't have So they would be money. using tax money? Uh, my guess is, yes, sir. 
So that the, would be my the guess. Taxpayers of the town would could be fronting the money for an apartment complex, and then it the certainly could be. And, the, and then the town would get maybe half that back. That's possible, yes, sir. Absolutely, that is possible. Commissioner Russian, it has been talked about in the past. This is what, when I came on the board, you said we were told that developers would have to pay the cost of these lines. And what Brian is saying is if uh, the town wants to run sewer and water out to a town hall and then an adjoining property owner wants to build an apartment complex and they get it rezoned in that particular town, they would have to pay part of the cost of that line construction back to the town. And the 50% has not been voted on yet. That's it? correct. Yes, sir. This is, this is a draft for, you, the, for the board to give us comments on. That but is all this is. Let's say this is basically the same thing Marshville did when they ran water and sewer out to that uh, development center. And they had hoped that uh, development would occur along there to grow. You know which one I'm talking about, the one. And so this, the city of Monroe does this now. And they do. We've talked about it for two years and just now got it to the point where we're getting ready. It enables people to put in high cost transmission lines that we don't have to pay for. And when people tap on it, it don't have to be a municipality. That's correct. Yeah, that's true. So this is dipping your toe in the water. We have not we have not developed this for for a private developer payback. This is just in this form for a municipal well, I, reimbursement. I think, I think where, like I said, we're, we're we're talking the same language except for Monroe and Marshall own their own systems. They have an enterprise fund. So they, they collect their own money, they, they have their own enterprise, like we have an enterprise fund, they do. And we've been adamant to people that, uh, again, we're not using tax money. We regularly are, are chastised because we're, somebody's paid taxes their whole life here and they don't get water. Certainly. And we always tell them that's because it comes out of the enterprise fund, not tax money. Mm -hmm. And now we, I'm afraid that that argument is out the window when we, when we take the count, now if we use county enterprise fund money to do the whole project, we're doing that. In, in Waxhaw, we have a project right now that mm -hmm. um, that uh, line that's going around what's Blythe Creek. Blythe Creek, yes, yeah, sir. We're paying for that. Mm -hmm. um, yes, sir. Uh, the county, that's the main transmission line that we're paying for. Yes, sir. But if if there was a side shoot off that that went to a developer and, and the developer could get three votes in a town or four votes in a town or how many ever votes he would need in a town, uh, he would he would he could save that cost and the taxpayers of that town would have to bear that cost and then the town could get reimbursed for half that cost mm -hmm. hey. but as you said about that shiny object on the horizon these towns could use some of their ARP money to put that line in to enable growth in an area that we're not or the developer didn't want to do yeah. it so again this is I just want to assure that we're not using or, or that we're encouraging the towns to use taxpayer money to fund things that they that um, you know many of them don't agree with you know like like I said an apartment complex now if it were if it were an economic development tool um, I think it out to like jobs coming right. into the town. I, I think if the board has concerns about what these could be used for, then what we would want is direction for how we could further define this. Right now, it's not defining it that way. And if the board wants that, yes, sir. And read this thing uh, at the same time. but. Uh, Commissioner Rushing again, Mr. Matthews, is he is looking for feedback on this, but as it's currently drafted, this section that you're talking about pertains to, uh, quote, any property that municipality owns and is developing itself, which requires the extension of existing infrastructure of the utility. So, before, uh, before we go any further, I appreciate that clarification. You wanted to say, did you? Uh, you're okay. Go ahead, Stone. 
Uh, you want to finish it? Yeah, I just, uh, I just wanted uh, perhaps some legal comment on this. Uh, the last uh, sentence in that section three says county and municipality agreed and negotiate in good faith to enter into such a reimbursement agreement, finalizing the reimbursement process and terms prior to municipalities construction of such a municipal extension. Uh, this gives me some confidence in moving forward, at least with this section, because it contemplates there will need to be a reimbursement agreement. Absolutely. I mean, this, this specifies the 50% amount right. of reimbursement, but it also, it contemplates that there will need to be a reimbursement agreement with terms, presumably some of those terms might be, well, this is not to be used for residential development. I mean, um, so I, I personally feel pretty confident sure. uh, with that part, but would love some feedback. Commissioner Williams, uh, you're correct in that a further agreement would come before the board. It's an interlocal agreement. Those are right. required to uh, be brought before the board again. So there's a second pass at this. However, there was a sense that without giving any guidance, uh, any goalposts at all right. in the clause that it would be too open-ended to be able to fit in this agreement, you know, what right. are we negotiating over? So we put those provisions in there as uh, some mile markers, but obviously there's a good bit more detail that would need to be hammered out in each one of these, and those agreements would come back before the board for approval at that time. Right. Very good. And, and I don't think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think this, pro this actually mandates that you actually have to agree to this. I think the board can actually choose that municipality. I don't think that's a project that we intended on there being a cost share for. We're, we're not comfortable with this being a project that you fund in this manner. And I want to point out something. The board has, the board has asked us on a number of times to look in this whole development reimbursement um, process. And I'm not a big fan of it, but I will tell you that Monroe does it and they are very selective. Not everyone gets to do it, and they are very selective over which projects they choose and how, how they choose them. So it's not a, hey, I'm gonna build a sewer line and I wanna get half my money back. It's the city determines, is that a benefit? What does it do for their system? And then they make a decision and move forward. I envision this the same way. It's not just like staff sitting there reading and going, okay, municipality, you got your application in, we're gonna give you the, that's not how this works. The board still has some interaction in this. Brian, I wanna say something that too. It is not in our purview to tell the cities how to spend their money or where to spend it. But this gives them a vehicle if they really want it to happen, it gives them a way of funding it. You know, just like we did the Indian Trail water line enlargement. Economic, mm -hmm. you remember we did that yes, with sir. economic development money. Yes, sir. Third, a third, a third. And once we got all that together, that project moved forward. Indian Trail's not fussing about low water pressure on Main Street. So what I'm saying is we, as the provider, we've got to give them tools to work with where they can make what they want to happen in their towns. Their towns is their call. Certainly. Certainly, Qu sir. Question. Mm -hmm. as, as a developer, once he puts the lines in and then we turn it over to us to run water in it, those lines become property of Utility. Uni County Correct. Utility, same, yes, sir. Same thing applies here, right? Yes, sir. Okay. They become our ownership, our maintenance responsibility. They're ours. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. And, and so like a pump station or anything like that, that would go along with it. We, we have to maintain that, take care of it. Yes, We're taking pump stations offline in Waxhaw now as part of that project. We are trying How to. How much was that project? Like $16 million? I, That sounds about right, but I don't have the exact number. Yeah. I can get it for you, yeah, but I, I don't have I the exact I'm number. I'm just remembering close to that number. I, I think that's accurate. And, and again, this is not about the towns. This is about treating everyone fairly, even county projects, because if we told a town project, and, and again, I understand this better now, because what you were telling me, and what you know it it works out better in my mind sure. i just want to make sure that we weren't telling a town project yes. for an apartment complex that they could get half their money back absolutely and we were telling a county project with uh you know two houses an acre uh that they could because that would be unfair to the development community as a whole in the county certainly and we would definitely get challenges on that i would think i understand your concern yes yeah. sir all right so okay. 
more questions about this section because this is new. We, we've never had this type of a reimbursement um, arrangement. Um, uh, th this was something that we felt that the municipalities are different than developers. They're, they're not developers, so what could we do to incentivize them to be part of the solution? And this was just something that, that the, the manager and we had a lot of conversations about this, and, and I think it actually was well received by the municipalities as an option on that one. Um, whoop, I did not expect that to happen. Okay, so. Number four, uh, that is talking about the input and that the municipalities have into our master plan and into the CIP. And as Mr. Former was talking about, they're, they're already in the process of meeting with the towns and collecting data from the towns about their growth projections, their information for how they intend on growing their communities. That all needs to be part of a master plan. And then ultimately, it needs to be part of a CIP, which that's where the rubber hits the road. That's where the money comes from, it's the CIP. And annually, the board will establish a CIP that you want us to fund projects with. And each year we'll come back to you and say, these are the projects. Hey, we identified these things in the master plan. Now we're moving forward with these things in the master plan over a period of time. And so it's important that we get feedback from our municipalities and ultimately discuss, are there projects that they think are beneficial that should be in the CIP? And the board, do you agree or disagree? Because ultimately it's your decision. It's your CIP that you adopt. So do you agree with those things? And that's how that is structured. So number five, and that's really, uh, five and six are sort of really the last two important ones. Five is talking about package plants. We've had a lot of discussion about, uh, you know, how package plants operate, the cost of maintaining them, uh, you know, and the issues that we have with package plants. And, and while the county has several that we own and maintain, and one of them is in very good shape, some of the other ones aren't. And we were very clear that we feel that the county is not going to be responsible for taking over and maintaining and owning package plants if a municipality decides that that is better for their community for a purpose. We're not taking away their ability to make that decision. If they feel that a package plant will serve an area better and we just can't serve it in, the, in, in enough, a close enough time to make it work for them, that's a decision they can make. We're just making it very clear that the county is not going to be on the hook for owning and maintaining those package plants. Um, I, I think that's fairly reasonable. If you want to make a decision to have it, that's great. Just don't expect us to take it and maintain it. I think that's a reasonable position. And that's what that's stating there. And last but not least, the term, the term right now says for 30 years. Um, obviously, there is a component in there where you can opt out or you can say, I don't want to be part of it. We do ask that they give a two-year written notice for that. Uh, again, this is an agreement. Municipalities and the county can always amend this agreement. You can make changes to it at any point in time. But right now, it is structured for a 30-year term with a two-year notice if you decide you, you don't want to participate in that anymore. So those are really the nuts and bolts of the draft agreement at this point in time. I'm really looking for some feedback from the board. Are there things that you like, dislike, some things you like to see changed? Just looking for feedback because obviously we want the municipalities to have our final version so they can make a decision. Mr. Wright. I, have, I want you to clarify something, Brian. Yes, Comparing what we did at Waxhaw to take all those pump stations offline mm -hmm. and comparing that to say Indian Trail doing something is apples and oranges. It is, yes sir. I mean to say we can't do it for one for the other, we already had those pump stations. They were already giving us trouble and we replaced it with a gravity line around that knoll. Am I correct? Yes sir. We yes sir. That, that's essentially what we did. So what I'm saying we made an investment to improve our future there. Right. I, I could see this as, uh, so obviously this isn't municipally owned property, but I'll just give you an example of concern that some of our municipalities may have. We have what's called a, a um, gray line system in the county, and, and we're moving forward with trying to replace that. 
because it's an old technology. It's got essentially a septic tank that each individual lot has, and really the, the water just flows through the system is what it does. It serves two houses per septic tank. Yeah, it really can't, it can't serve a lot, and it certainly can't really serve businesses very well. But there are circumstances where this exists. It doesn't provide a real public utility purpose for a business option, but I could see a town wanting to figure out how can we change out some of these gray line systems so that we have a more uh, a current public sewer system. That's not the same as running a interceptor line. That's, that's, a, different, that's a different animal. But I could see a municipality sitting down with this board and saying, we would like for you to put that in your CIP because that's important to us to see that change out so that we can see better commercial development in this area. And you as a board could say, yes, we agree with you. We think that is a board CIP decision. Or you could say, no, municipality, we don't think that that's something we're going to do right now. It's not a top our priority list. So you have to figure out another way to get that funded. I can see those types of projects us talking about. Brian, I, uh, I know we've got some elected officials here with us today and some probably watching. And you talk about not accepting package plants. Yes, sir. Would, would you entertain a tour for some of our elected officials that they want to understand a package plant? I think Grassy would Branch be. would be a good one to see. Oh, yes, uh, sir. You have to walk around to keep from getting the fluid on you. Uh, they are. Uh, a challenge and maybe helping some of our communities understand the virtues of a package plant. We're always helpful. open to allowing for anyone to come out and, and do a little tour with our other elected officials. Yes, sir. Absolutely. So, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. And, and just, Commissioner Rich, so you know I wasn't picking on Waxhaw. Uh, Pedro, you're back there. I see you. Uh, you know, we spent 30 million putting water line, uh, transmission water line to over to the Indian Trail area, and we spent, we're looking at spending another 20, 30 million dollars to put it to wing it. I mean, we do that. That's part of the issue. Absolutely. That's not, that wasn't a, um, that we gave a certain gift to Waxhaw or anything like that. We no, do sir. those projects, um, which goes back to, you know, just like we're talking with our short line extension. That we subsidize, or where where there's a cost per customer mm -hmm. to what we're doing. So, yep. you know, we could use that on any project that we do with public works. You yes, know, sir. What what was the thirty million dollars? Uh, thirty million dollars going to? How much would that break out per customer? That's why I was asking about like with the sewer. Sure. Uh, how much does how much do the ratepayers subsidize a sewer connection in a house? You know, if, is there a number to that? And it could vary from project to project. Sure. And, and again, by no means picking on Waxhaw about $16 million because we spend a lot of money in other places. The water tank in Weddington, the, um, you know, there's a lot of projects that we put in different places and that's not what I'm challenging. Uh, I just did want to, the only thing I challenged with this that I see the concern was is are we, would we be half subsidizing any residential projects and, and the answer I think is going to be no. I, you're not in, you're not incentivizing that, and the right. board makes the decision. Right. Honestly, yes, sir. That is Thank how you. this is structured. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, if it pleases the board, if discussion is concluded on um, this part of the uh, agenda, uh, I'd like to move that we amend this draft interlocal agreement. I believe my fellow commissioners all have a copy of. Uh, the language that I'm proposing uh, that be inserted between items uh, two and three on page two of the draft in a local agreement. Um, the language is as follows. Uh, the heading is embracing a model of allocating and purchasing capacity. County and municipality agree in principle that future system capacity for water and wastewater is to be allocated to the towns by Union County Water and Sewer District, by the Union County Water and Sewer District. Specifically, the parties embrace the principle that towns should have the freedom to pay for varying levels of capacity based upon municipal needs and fiscal constraints. Furthermore, 
The parties support the creation of multiple and distinct service areas within the water and sewer district where pricing and utility policies consistent with a utility-based rationale can be adopted. And uh, I invite discussion, or perhaps I can start with a defense of well, my motion. Okay. Um, you know, in this agreement, um, I, I think the general counsel, uh, I, I love the description you gave that it contains signposts. You know, and I think, um, you know, I think that's a, 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 an apt description. Uh, it's something that uh, doesn't bite hard, I think, like a, you know, you would expect a typical contract would do, you know, where, um, you know, there, you know, are uh, breaches and where there are breaches, there are penalties for those breaches, and um, it's more aspirational in a lot of ways. It establishes signposts. We, well, we already know what some of those signposts are, that we recognize the county, um, by and large, is going to be the provider of water and sewer. Um, we recognize that package plants, um, um, our package plants aren't going to be embraced and run by the, the county should towns uh, pursue those. Um, we recognize that where there's a municipal extension, uh, should agreement be, be gained between a municipality and a county, uh, that the reimbursement for that would be 50 percent. Um, and, and what I'm suggesting here in terms of the additional draft language, um, it's another signpost. It basically suggests a model for how we grow our system. Uh, and I think a new model is something that we very much need. Because right now we have um, a system where the growth in our water and sewer system is paid for uh, almost entirely by ratepayers, by the volumetric ratepayers. And um, frankly, that's a system that's just not sustainable. Um, and staring at uh, increases uh, that we all have to pay as ratepayers. Um, additionally, we have a, a landscape right now where the towns basically face a marginal cost of zero when it comes to uh, new water and sewer. Right now there's the expectation that water and sewer will just be available, but there's not really a cost attached to that uh, for the towns. Um, and I think, you know, uh, scarcity is a very important concept. We deal with scarcity every day uh, when we negotiate in the marketplace for goods and services. Well, I can't think of, you know, anything in this job uh, that's more scarce uh, than water and sewer. I, I can tell you, as a new commissioner, it seems to uh, take up most of my time and, and most of my mental energy. Um, so we need to start treating uh, water and sewer as scarce goods. And I think by moving towards a model where towns are paying for capacity, uh, it introduces that concept of scarcity, which I think is very important uh, for the county. Uh, now, what's important in this model to the towns? Well, I think the most important part of it is the towns get allocated capacity. They have capacity they can count on. And boy, do I know in my short tenure already as a commissioner, uh, I've gotten an earful about uh, how towns, many towns, are desperate for capacity and they want capacity that they can count on. And, and even, indeed, even some freedom about choosing the level of capacity they want. Um, so I think that's important. Um, I, I think uh, by giving the towns skin in the game, so to speak, uh, by having the towns uh, contribute uh, to uh, the capital requirements, capital expenditure requirements for growing the system, um, we'll end up in a situation where the towns are communicating much better with the county and vice versa in terms of their planning and their capacity needs. Um, I think uh, the other, the lastly, I think the other part of this that I, I really uh, think highly of is the idea of establishing service areas. Uh, that's something that we're not doing in our uh, system currently, but I think uh, it behooves us to, to really embrace that concept. Um, and that, that gives uh, a lot more predictability in our system in terms of uh, understanding uh, future needs, but it also, I think, gives us a little bit more control which I, as towns and, and county, which I appreciate, uh, because sometimes in this job you find that, or I found, uh, that control is elusive, uh, and sometimes it's an illusion. Uh, we can influence certain, certain things, but uh, controlling them is a different matter. So if we establish service areas, that gives us at least 
a bit more influence and perhaps some control in terms of patterns of development. And that's important because there's some towns that have very different visions for development than others. And that's okay. We need to, I think, celebrate. We need to embrace. Uh, we need to appreciate that different municipalities have different visions for their development patterns. And to the extent we have towns, um, you know, that, that want to moderate their, their development, then a, a, I think a, a map or a service area gives those populations more confidence. Um, and, it, and by establishing service areas, that's going to take an action of the Board of County Commissioners. So I think that's important too. If there's a change in a service area, that's not something that's just done on the staff level. That's something that uh, prospectively we as a board majority would have to change. So uh, I, I don't want to uh, abuse the privilege here, but I, I, I very much like this idea in terms of uh, a new model and, and perhaps an aspirational language uh, to the draft agreement, and I would strongly urge my, my peers to, to consider it. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Commissioner Rushing? Mr. Chair. Um, and, and that, when we started talking about an allocation policy, that's kind of where that I was looking that that's what we were doing is that there is a scarce resource, as been said, uh, if a town had a limited amount of sewer capacity and then they had to come back. Now, what I'm not certain of is like the purchasing of or the, we get back to who's paying for it because these towns don't have normally a uh, enterprise fund to be able to pay for that. So I'll lean on legal uh, for that. But, um, but as far as the, you know, if a town has X number of gallons, the decisions they make with those X number of gallons before they come back to the Board of Commissioners for another set of, of uh, capacity, that that would be a good idea that everybody's making decisions, not just in the infinite, uh, you know, just out in space, that they actually have a, a goal and a target that they can shoot for. Uh, so in this, in this agreement anywhere else, is that uh, stated any better than what, what he's put in this amendment? Uh, the current draft does not reflect any policy related to allocation capacity or purchase. Because mm -hmm. a town like um, the Wesley Chapel, for example, that would be very um, uh, probably, I'm trying to think of the right word, stingy is not the right word, um, that would be very conservative with their, with their use of sewer um, might uh, have a good project come later on that if it's been taken up by another town then they can't do that project so so the fact that a town you know that um, we can't have a town sit on it forever either I mean that's that's not possible so if in this contract if if you think this language works uh, if there's any concerns that you have can you address them with us in open session I think as far as an aspirational policy, this gets there on that guidepost. I might uh, ask uh, Commissioner Williams in, the, in making the motion just so we make sure we remain uh, faithful to that. Uh, if we could have some, some room where we need to adjust little bits of language that are substantially consistent with this, but give us the room to be able to draft that into what you're requesting here after whatever vote is made on the motion. Yeah, I have no objection to that. And uh, again, I, this is very aspirational. Um, it's it's basically borrowed to some degree to what from what uh, the Raleigh water system is doing. I mean, um, they have there are a number of towns in Wake County, and um, Raleigh has developed a system where those towns in Wake County uh, basically do a capital buy-in um, and help grow the system. So, I, but no objections whatsoever to to minor modifications in keeping with the aspirational spirit of the you know. Uh, the language. Commissioner Williams, I think I think what you're asking us to do is modify the draft. Is this is stated this is a draft right now? Yes. Is that a fair statement? That's correct. Okay. Commissioner uh, What I want to say, I'll be voting in support of Commissioner Williams' amendment to the agreement. And I just want to remind Commissioner Russian when I voted to fund expansion on the ratepayers, I was attacked. So you can't have your cake 
and eat it too. I mean, somebody's got to pay for this, and either the volumetric ratepayers pay it, or the people that benefit from it. And I think Commissioner Williams said it very good when he said most of them, when they expand, they have a minuscule amount of money going into the high density, but they receive full ad valorem off of it. Commissioner Rushing, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not quite sure where you're coming from because my question was, because the municipalities don't have an enterprise fund, where does their money come from? So it's like we have an enterprise fund. Um, so that was my concern with the money. As far as this goes, the uh, people who who are paying, you know, do are are the town's taxpayers going to be responsible? And I don't see that we can make them responsible for this. I think it's a legal issue that maybe my my few more years of experience in dealing with these issues just gave me concern. Nothing about who pays for it, other than how does it get paid for it? And it's got to be an enterprise fund. An enterprise fund, I think. I just don't think you can make the taxpayers in the towns pay for it. And and that's the concern I have. Not um, not the fact that they could buy capacity. That would be fantastic. It's just how can we legally require them to if we're requiring the taxpayers to do it. If you're shifting tax money to enterprise money, that's where I have some concerns. Well, that's why one of the reasons it's a draft. And Jason, you look like you want to say something, so uh, go ahead. It was perhaps on just that point. This is a draft that will be subject to further negotiation. Obviously, we're one party to the transaction. There will, there will be others. Um, and we're talking about making amendments to the draft um, to Commissioner Rushing, specifically your uh, question about where the towns uh, choose to pay for this. Uh, as it's drafted now, that's within the discretion of the town. If they feel they have freedom to create a fund for this or that or pay it out of certain pockets, that's entirely in their discretion. That's not something that we have any uh, control or influence over right now that would be attributed back to the county. Commissioner Williams. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, correct me if I'm, staff, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, fellow commissioners, correct me if I'm wrong, but prior to uh, Union County is setting up its own enterprise fund, uh, we, uh, we didn't, obviously didn't have an enterprise fund. So, uh, and statutorily, there are no objections to, there, there are no prohibitions against uh, tax money uh, or general obligation funds being used to, to build a water and sewer system, indeed, towns throughout North Carolina can and do spend funds that are not enterprise funds. I, I, I have not personally looked at that issue. I'd be glad to, but again, that, that would be something that the towns would probably discuss with their legal counsel, and uh, I'm, I'm sure those, those apt uh, attorneys for those towns can help them with that. And just one other thing, too, I know with this American Rescue Plan money, uh, one of the things, if I'm not mistaken, one of the things that can be used for is water and sewer. And the feds have just showered American rescue funds on counties and towns. So in terms of where this comes from, conceivably from tax revenues, but conceivably from ARP funds. Mr. K, I think I'm no lawyer, and you and Mr. Williams are, but what I was hearing him say, Union County's public works has not always been an enterprise fund. It was part of county government, wasn't it? I believe that's correct as a matter of history, but that's not something that I've, I've looked at recently. I'd be glad to look at that and but talk do you about see what he's, how we I can mean, do that. I, I, what I'm hearing I him do say, understand. some towns run everything through one account. It, yes, sir. I, I believe that's uh, correct. However, my, my role is to advise so the county on its legal rights. that any of these municipalities from doing it as part of their na annual budget, like Union County did up until the enterprise and the soil and water, I mean the sewer and water district was set up. Yeah, I, I, I think I understand your question and the answer. I, I don't have an objection to them doing that, but it's not my province to say whether they can or can't. Okay, Commissioner Rushing, and and again, an excellent way for these towns to do it uh, would maybe be like Union County did many years ago in the 70s when they passed a bond for sewer and water. Uh, the towns could always do a bond vote of their citizens and. Their citizens can tell them if they want to continue growing and doing all these great things with sewer and water. Yeah, and apologies for getting us into the weeds. Ultimately, you're right. This is up to the town to decide how to finance. I mean, we can speculate 
you know, bond here, tax money there, enterprise fund, uh, you know, ARP monies, but it's up to the town to decide clearly. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Appreciate it. Mr. Matthews? Thank you, sir. That is all I have today, sir. Um, Unless you have any other questions. Um, we, yes, sir. We've got some information here from uh, Tony, I believe. Uh, again, that was the capacity. That was the capacity? Yeah, I can certainly not. Saying that in public for you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So just uh, can, board can the manager make a statement, please. I'm no, oh, sorry. Before we get into that, I'd just like to get a point of clarification regarding the, the interlocal agreement. So we've been back and forth with the municipalities a number of times, uh, and there have been uh, changes each time it goes back and forth, um, and. Uh, I believe that the, this board has uh, said it just now in its vote that it, it supports the language that is currently in this. Um, I would take that uh, to mean that if we submit this to the towns and then we get uh, requests for changes, that that really needs to come back to the board for review um, unless the board wants to vest that authority to negotiate any further on its behalf with the towns. But I think we've reached a point in this interlocal agreement where those changes uh, that may be requested by the, the towns should be coming back to the board. Is that, okay. it, is, is that what my understanding would be? That would be mine, yes, absent minor changes. Based on your well, based on uh, your recommendation, I I think we should, we don't need to take away. So we've got very talented staff. I think the final document has to come back to us to be approved. Yeah, absolutely. And but the negotiations between the towns and our and our staff should continue. It's been very effective so far. And I, I wouldn't want to preclude that. So uh, I'll make a motion that we let staff work out the uh, nuances between what the towns may perceive and, and the county. And then when we cut, the, but the final document does require this board's approval. Is that fair? Yes, yeah, sir. I'd just like the board to know that we'll, if there are any changes that come back from the municipalities uh, to this document that you've uh, approved uh, today that we will pass those changes along to y'all, uh, provide you with copies so you are up to date on what those changes may, uh, suggested changes may be uh, and are not caught off guard about that. Okay. All right, Commissioner Rushing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and another thing, like, and this goes along with the capacity that we got here. Um, when when do we foresee maybe voting on that? Because we talked a little bit about our next meeting, uh, I believe in August. Um, we have a lot of people that are calling us and inquiring on the um, when we're going to lift the the stop on on uh, permits going in. Do we have any? date that we're shooting for or, or, or do we need to express to the towns in your discussions with them that we're trying to get this capacity allocation and, and move forward with uh, so that people can do uh, what they need to do are we getting any further along on our um, project that uh, we're going to six mile creek we can that we're i think we're doing some liner in, the, in a pipe uh, any kind of updates with that stuff so it was, our, it was our anticipation that we would not be asking the board to remove the cap until the Tar Kiln project was completed. We are still estimating that project to be completed end of August, sometime September, hopefully. Uh, once that's done, that's the diversion project to, uh, to go to Six Mile, Pre uh, Six Mile Creek. We would hope that at that point in time we would have that completed. Maybe we would have 
the interlocal agreement completed at that point, and we would come back to the board and say, here it is, this is what we currently have, and ask you to remove the cap. So but that's possibly our first, second meeting in September. That, yeah, that would be our goal. Yes, sir. Absolutely. That's, you said when the Tar Heel's finished, but if the cap still is exceeded, we can't remove that. that that's correct. Well, and, the board can remove the well, cap. Well, I, I, underst I understand, but it's not, it's not in the, the county's best interest to continue adding load to the, to the system if that's not, if that's not reducing. Well, I, I, that's I, something we'll have to evaluate once we get see. Because my understanding, Tar Hill, right now, when you take a fluid from 12 miles to Tar Hill, right. it still counts against 12 miles. No, it does not. It doesn't. It comes into the plant, but it doesn't get counted against the plant. Well, that's I not think, what I was told. Earlier. And I, I apologize. It, it comes into the into the property, but it's diverted before it gets counted into the plant. System. But that diversion's not there now, is it? It, no, sir, because it's under, obviously, in repair. The Tar Heel, okay. So, yeah, so, and it will not be completed until, we believe, September. Now, and I get what you're saying. What, what we're talking about here is understanding that as long as we're getting better weather conditions, which if you can see, we actually are. We went down from 99% at 12 mile to 98%. I know that's a small needle, but that's, that's 75,000 gallons. You know, that's enough for some projects. So we recognize that over time, if we get good weather conditions, we get the diversion project finished, then, then we can give some additional capacity while we're waiting for the full expansion to be completed. So we will be asking the board to consider that. Obviously, you cannot remove the cap or you can establish the cap at a different level. I mean, if you wanted to move it to a different level and say, well, we, we won't go above this, that's fine too. But we understand that there are some folks out there that are waiting and we cannot give them capacity until the board removes the cap. We just can't. So there, that's a decision you'll have to make at some point in the future. Okay. All right, do you want me to tell you about the capacities that I've got here? Okay, no, I didn't, I didn't well, know if fine. you wanted me to go I, through I, them I, with you or not. That's fine. Okay, all right. I, I was just wondering a date kind of on the shoot that we were shooting for. Uh, the goal, I, I believe, is sometime in September, hopefully. That's our goal. Mr. Russian, the, the other thing I would add to Brian's update on that is we do have some inflow infiltration projects. Or anal we've, we've finished the analysis, but we've got a project that will be coming to the board. I believe it will be in um, August. Is that right, Hung Yi? Um, that will uh, mitigate a significant, should mitigate a significant amount of inflow into 12 Mile Creek. Um, but you'll be seeing that uh, on your August agenda. So we continue to work on those inflow infiltration. And uh, when, we, when we look at what, you know, it, when you say short term, that's all relative, um, you know, within the next 12 months, if you look at the Tar Kiln uh, force main repair, any kind of diversion, uh, improvements at 12 mile and any kind of inflow infiltration mitigation in a 12 mile creek those are all relatively short term type projects that could yield some additional or I would say I, would, I wouldn't call it additional capacity I'll, I'll call it more efficient use of our capacity that we currently have um, but any kind of long term you know, gains, um, you know, short of the uh, expansion of 12 mile taking place and, and any other project being approved, you know, we're, we, are, we are running out of capacity um, at a pretty quick clip. Okay. That's all. Any further comments? Then I'll uh, move the board go into closed session for the following. Good point. Okay. Any further discussion on it? All in favor? Aye. Uh, okay. Thank you, son. I move the board go into closed session for the following purposes in accordance with GS 143 318 11 A3. 
to consult with an attorney in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege and in, in accordance with GS 143-318-11-A5 to establish or to instruct the public body, staff, or negotiation agents concerning the position to be taken on behalf of the public body in negotiating the price and or other material terms of a contract or proposed contract for the acquisition of real property. In favor? Good. Go ahead. All right. Thank you, Brian.